of your uh, very busy schedules to be to be here today. I can't tell you how thrilled I am, given the time of the year. We've got pension reforms going on. Um, it's the end of the tax year, uh, and and you've all been able to um, to make it. So thank you very very much. Um, <laughs> Lots of familiar faces in the room today, many through our uh, interaction on, on Twitter. By interaction, I mean those moments that I stick my fingers um, in, in, your, in your noses with my comments and drive you crazy, for which I profusely apologize, by the way. Um, um, that's not to say that I'm not going to do it again. <laughs> and there are many of our own clients of Finlitic in the room today. Um, I know that um, by now you, 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 you realize how extremely lucky you are um, to be working with us. But seriously, thank you all for, for coming. Um, the Retirement Income Conference, as with everything um, we do at Finlitic, it's, it's, you know, it's the result of a brainwave I had. There's absolutely no plan. So in case you think that there is a, a big machine, um, you know, essentially organizing this stuff. Absolutely not. We're just basically making this up as we go along. Okay, so, um, but it, it, it came as a result of conversations that I have had with several planners. One of the um, great joys of my, of my work is that we get to see what planners do. We get to, to see what advisors do within their, with their, within their businesses and we ask a lot of, um, if you like, challenging questions and we have conversations about these things and and um, this isn't particularly um, something driven if you like by the pension reforms this is essentially as a result of um, I think there, there are seats in there. okay <laughs> <laughs> But, but this is um, it's essentially as a result of really questioning how we do things, how we do financial planning, how we do cash flow modeling, um, having conversations with planners about, well, um, you know, what is a sustainable re withdrawal rate from, from, um, from, from a retirement portfolio, and really keen to, to find um, if you like, a scientific or, you know, academically um, sound underpinning for, for what we do in financial services. So, um, if there is any, any aspect in financial planning that you don't want to make it up as you go along, it's definitely retirement income planning. And so that's really what the Retirement Income Conference is all about. It's to explore, um, if you like, the latest thinking around retirement income planning. Um, and, and so we're, we're really looking forward to this. I want to take this opportunity to thank our sponsors and the, delegate, um, the, the exhibitors. So um, when I pitched the idea to, to, to Viva, I was obviously expecting them to say bugger off. Um, but, <laughs> but, um, but um, you know, they didn't and they, you know, Put, put, put their support behind, behind the conference and the white paper that, that we published earlier, earlier this, this year. So unless you've been out of the country or dead for the last few weeks, you would have seen me um, in the media writing about pound cost ravaging. Um, and in case you, you know, just, just because you haven't had enough of it, there is a copy of that white paper in the pack on your table. So, um, <laughs> So, right. and, and it's essentially laying the foundation for, for some of the things that we're going to be um, talking about today. So, a round of applause for Aviva for, for their support in this. Um, and I didn't want this to be some sort of theoretical conference. I wanted us to have um, a practical 
um, make, make it as practical as possible. And that's why we got Iris and, and Capital in, essentially to demo the, the, the retirement income tools and, and to, to give us all a chance, you know, um, you know, an, an opportunity to ask questions. Where is Martin? Is Martin in the room? Martin keeps asking me these questions about the black box nature of Monte Carlo and stochastic modeling tool. Well, here's your chance to ask them. Um, <laughs> and and, and, um, uh, and we're, we're really thrilled to, to have them um, as part of the conference. So I'm going to um, get out of the way. Just, just a few housekeeping um, you know, points. There are no fire, um, there is no fire um, test planned for today. So if the alarm goes off, it is real. Um, the the, 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 the um, best exit, I've been told, is just really straight down um, and, and to your left. Um, but I'm sure that we will have some, some direction from the, um, from the staff members if, we, if, if that were to be the case. So with that, um, just to give you an idea of what we are, <laughs> we've got planned today, that, um, there's an agenda in the pack as well, just gives you an idea of what we've got set up today. So we're going to have the first presentation from Tim, um, and essentially exploring how pension products are going to evolve um, going forward. What are the client expectations? How are they going to change in the pension um, freedom era? And then we're going to have Michael Kitsis. Uh, Michael is going to be talking about safe withdrawal rates and sequencing risk in retirement portfolio. We'll, we'll have a coffee break um, after that and then come back to Phil Mowbray's presentation on essentially um, using Monte Carlo um, simulations to, to model retirement outcomes and, and capture risk. Then we'll have the breakout, the breakout session. Um, we go over to the IRIS and the Aviv, Aviva and Capital's desk, just essentially to um, play around with their tools. And from there we go, we go off to lunch around about 10 past one. And we'll be back here past two for the Q&A session. And we were expecting that that will run through, through to around about 10 minutes to three, and with a plan to wrap everything up at three o'clock. So we're not making that one up as we go along. Um, um, yeah, so um, I'm going to introduce Tim. I've only had the chance to, to speak to Tim um, twice, actually. Um, and it struck me as a very thoughtful, um, and as one um, fund manager who used to work for Tim um, said to me, the guy really knows his stuff. Um, Tim is, is an actuary, or started out as an actuary, and he's gone on to run um, pensions and investment propositions at, at Aviva. He's currently the CEO of the Aviva platform. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Martin. Thank you. 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 Um, we're making this up as we go along, and I think that was a great demonstration for you. Um, so, yeah, great to be here. And um, oh, I clicked something. It's what's that interesting combination of letters there? But hopefully, it'll go away as we as we go through. Um, yeah, great to be here. I'm delighted for Aviva to be uh, sponsoring this event, um, and uh, and and the the latest presentation of cost ravaging, which um, fascinating term uh, to me. Uh, you'll see a few pictures from me. I'm interested in the like a whirlwind there, which is um, potentially very apt for the new tax year that is coming. So, today, lots of interesting things for you to learn about. Um, sequencing risk, 
and so there's a lot of interesting expressions. I think I can just about say most of them. Um, lot, lots to learn, but, but not from me, which is a big relief. So my uh, job, uh, my luxury perhaps, um, is to just set the scene a little bit, give you a little bit of context um, before those more technically able than I, um, despite Abraham's kind of introduction, um, uh, to take up the baton and, uh, and, and go forward from there. So, what am I going to talk to you about? A little bit about the future um, and some of the leaders thinking. Um, customers, um, I'm sure at the heart of everything we do. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what some of our customers are telling us. Some of the analysis that we've done around that. Um, and also uh, highlight as we go along uh, the need for your help. Because in my mind, if there's one time coming when good advice was required for many people, it's now. Winston Churchill, you'll see Winston pop up occasionally. Now, I didn't know this until recently, but Winston Churchill was actually an Avita customer. Um, he's also famous for, for many quotes. Um, I, have a, I have a few. I'm just going to turn to them, because um, I'm, not, I'm not a great historian. Uh, but there's a couple that may be relevant in the new text here that's coming um, around all the pension reforms. So there's one here that a pessimist sees a difficulty in every opportunity, but an optimist sees the opportunity in every difficulty. So with all the extra responsibilities out there for people um, and extra things to understand, and we'll, we'll come and, and, and talk about some of those and, and what people are telling us soon, um, <coughs> hopefully there's plenty of optimists in the room. <coughs> There's another one which I hope you don't have to think about, um, which is, if you're going through help, keep going. That's a bit of context about, about Winston. So, future of the retirement market. This is, I guess, how it sometimes feels. And certainly a year ago, um, who could have predicted what the, uh, what the Chancellor was going to do? This is, a, this is a, perhaps a better image for me, the lights at the end of the tunnel. We're, we're getting more clarity now. And there's a few, um, a few points here. So it's now 349 days, uh, apparently, since the budget, when the Chancellor um, quoted the, the most significant reforms to pension taxation and planning for, well, since 1921, I think is what he said. Um, but despite that, it's only 39 days since the CEO letter came out. So quite a long gap there with lots of uncertainty. 33 days until the 6th of April, although as I was looking at these slides this morning, I'm not sure that the person who prepared them knows how many days in March, but it's about that number. <laughs> <laughs> they may not be in the room, so we won't look at them. Um, but there's a lot coming, isn't there? There's more than 500,000 people uh, reaching 55 every year. So that's a lot of work for us all to do. 309, what does that refer to? That refers actually to the number of years that Aviva has sold annuities. So perhaps this is just a little bump in the road um, in, in a long-term uh, marketplace that will, that will just flow through nice and smoothly. So we're going to start to have a little look and try and predict the future. So I'll start with the pie chart. So this is some of our data. It's by customer number. So quite a lot of this is driven by uh, a lot of relatively small pots. So we are seeing a few people take trivial commutations, 3%. 80% most people are annuitizing. A relatively small number of customers going into drawdown. Um, you'll notice another image on the right. I um, don't know if anyone recognizes that. That is the Titanic. Guess what? The Titanic was also an Aviva customer. <laughs> so um, we insured the Titanic. Um, and um, I think the, uh, the owner uh, said that this boat is unsinkable. So since then, Aviva has always been a little bit cautious in making predictions, <laughs> thinking about the future, but we'll, we'll have a go here. Um, these are not official stats, but it gives you a sense of, of how things might change from, from how we understand our overall customer base. So certainly more people, we think, will take cash, because give someone the opportunity to take cash. Very often they do. Um, and then a more, much more even mix between annuity and drawdown going forward in our customer base. Now that will, time will tell, lots of debate, lots of people have different predictions, but those sorts of shifts, and, and what's most striking for me is that it is really quite a significant shift. Okay, just exploring a little bit more. 
about the future. So this is the number of people from Office of National Statistics data who are reaching 65 now. So that's a lot of people. And it's growing over time as the population ages. So there's an awful lot of activity. We're going to be really busy. But again, going back to Winston Churchill, an awful lot of opportunity. This refers back, sorry, you probably can't read uh, that one particularly well. It refers back again to lots of things where we don't know the full facts yet um, and how the market will work. So this is from the ABI. Um, one that strikes me is around pension-wise. So there's a bullet point there around pension-wise guidance sessions and understanding exactly how they work. So if customers are going between uh, providers, advisors, and pension-wise, if we don't really understand that conversation in full, how can the process work? So we're certainly trying to encourage and tease out as much as we can, as soon as we can. But time is getting time. So we'll go on a little bit to, um, to what our customers are telling us now. Um, again, I've got, you'll see Winston has popped up. I've got another quote here from, from Mr. Churchill, a great man, a great leader customer. So here it says, Courage is what it takes to stand up and speak. But courage is also what it takes to sit down and listen. And listening is really important. So we listen to our customers and listen to over a thousand customers every year. And what I'm going to take you through now is some data from uh, some of our uh, national and international findings. And hopefully some interesting stats. Okay, so we're going to start with uh, confidence levels. So there's a couple of lines there, in case you can't read. The blue one is net household confidence. The yellow one is around net general economic confidence. Okay, so we start in 2010, everyone's kind of neutral. Um, then everybody gets pretty depressed, bluntly. Um, in particular about the state of the economy, a bit about household. Um, and back to 2014, people are in a relatively more confident state, or, well, about as confident and, and optimistic as <coughs> we seem to get in this country. That's probably not surprising, given what's happened here in the economy, um, but interesting to see how people are starting to take a more positive outlook. So let's look internationally. How are we compared to the rest of the world? <coughs> so, not too bad. Interesting to see some of the Asian countries particularly optimistic about the future, perhaps to do with their strong economic growth. Um, some of the, um, the countries haven't come up on the labels on the right, I'm afraid. So I wonder if anyone can guess who the minus 42 is. Greece, Russia, actually France. I don't know what's going on in France. Okay, a bit more of a flat chart, this one, attitudes about homing in retirement. So, the darker line, I'm worried that I won't have enough money when I retire to provide an adequate standard of living. Just a more than half people tending to worry about that. The lighter line, I think I'm going to have to work beyond normal retirement date to find my retirement similar. So there's an interesting balance out there. Half the people broadly feel okay, half the people are worrying. What age group that was? Was it a mix? Um, sample of 10, I think it's a mix. Okay. We're typically doing in the retirement space, though, 55, 65, that sort of age, typically. You'll see some stats coming up about how it changes as well over, over different age ranges. Okay, so um, anxiety about retirement, again, how do we fare against uh, the rest of the world? So, again, Indonesia, it's quite a nice place to be, nobody's, or, or less people are worried. Um, my advice is, as you retire, do not go to Poland, because most people are pretty stressed. <coughs> but interestingly, it's not just a, a UK phenomenon, but, but globally, um, a reasonable proportion, more than half, typically, that people are worrying about the future. Okay, so here we go. Um, age and sex. So... Here across the top, you've got some different uh, statistics uh, by different age ranges, going from 18 to 24. 
through to 55 plus on uh, the right hand side. Uh, the box <coughs> the so let's see at the start, 32, just to, to talk you through the colours. So on the left, the greenish um, is agreeing that they are anxious. Uh, the yellow in the middle is neither agreeing or disagreeing. <coughs> um, the red ish colour is disagree, they're not worried. So there's a reasonable, reasonable mix. Um, at the start, even 18 to 24 year olds, 32% um, of them um, are worrying. So I have a 19 year old daughter and ask her whether she's worrying about retirement. I suspect not, actually. Um, but as you go through to the red, the red one in the middle there, and that's highlighted because most people are worrying, not because it's my age group. Just. Um, so, but, it, but that is the age that most people are worrying. 64% of people agree they are anxious about retirement at that age, which is interesting, quite a way off, but people are starting to worry. And without wanting to cause any heated debate, I'll skip across quite quickly from whether males or females are worrying, <coughs> or worrying more about retirement. Okay, <coughs> more data. Action and trust. So we start on the left hand side. The top half of that um, is where people have given us their thoughts on what level of income they think they need to survive in retirement. And there's quite a range. So the bottom number five here, 10%, have said they want the same income or need the same income in retirement. Interesting. Uh, the most common where people said 19%, about half. Um, and at the top, 4% of people think they'll survive with less than a quarter of their monthly income. Interesting. Not sure what kind of lifestyle that would bring, but interesting to see the range of people's expectations. <coughs> There's also, at the bottom half, you see in the red, half the people either didn't, haven't considered it or just don't know. So that's a great opportunity, a great opportunity for, for us to help them. So, how do they pe feel about people helping them on the right? Well, um, not so good. At least business, we're all in this together, business. Um, better than press and government, but minus 44 uh, means 44% didn't trust more than did. <coughs> so pretty negative. Okay, awareness. Pretty aware, creeping up, but most people know what's coming, which is good. How do they feel? Okay, 80% say it's a good idea. Good. Again, say to someone, now you can have some cash. Do you think that's a good idea? Yes, that's a good idea. <laughs> but actually, it's interesting that 80% are uncertain. So people are starting to get that this is complex, that they need to think carefully, um, and it's not just as simple as taking your cash, because once you've taken your cash, it's gone. So um, I think that's quite encouraging, actually, that people are being quite thoughtful, that they're ready to engage in, in some serious decisions. So what else about the budget? A few more stats, just to summarise. So positive, um, people feel... Uh, more positive in terms of peace of mind, but more control, but confused. They know they have to make more decisions, not necessarily prepared. But also interestingly, lots of people saying they need to have greater restraint. So it's not, again, it's not just about um, getting hold of the cash, but understanding that that has to last. Now then, financial advice. We asked an interesting provocative question here about we know people like to engage with friends and family. So despite that trust point <coughs> on businesses, <coughs> is it better to get advice from friends and family than the financial community? A few people agree, but most people disagree, which is really encouraging that people still seem to recognise and value that professional advice can help them through all of those uncertainties. So I think that's a very positive indicator. So where are we going to get to? In summary, okay, confident about the economy, well, at least not quite so miserable, <coughs> and confused about retirement. There's lots of things out there that people still need to understand uh, and where we can all help them. <coughs> so 
just, just going to summarise very quickly a little bit around um, life expectancy as well, which is a, one of the areas where uh, we find people have least understanding just how long does retirement income need to last. So what we've got here, just to explain some of the arrows, you've got men on the left, women on the right. Um, so from our research, and here we've got 50 to 65 year olds, so the first uh, arrow here is how long people think they will live in retirement. And men, I say in 15 years on average. But then when you look at what statistics tell you from um, mortality data, um, and in particular mortality data of, of your typical insured lives, and your health insured lives, the hidden figure there is 23. So that's an eight year gap. So if people planned on their own based on their own instincts, then they'd run out of money eight years early. Women, slightly less severe, 4.7 years is the gap there, but just a little snapshot again that just indicates <coughs> around the level of understanding um, people have um, around how long their money needs to last for them. <coughs> right, I think I need a deep breath, but it's not probably a drink. Um, so what we've done here is we've started to get into some modelling. And there'll be, there'll be others more expert than me in modelling in the room, um, I'm not sure, uh, more sophisticated techniques. But what we've done here is try to sort of game whether annuity would have been drawn down. So if I give you an example on the top left there, what we've done is we've started in 1999 and mapped, um, let's say, £100,000 pot, um, either putting that into an annuity and locking into a level of income based on the rates available at that time, or going into drawdown, uh, invested 100% in equity markets, and, and rolling that forward with the same income. And then by the time we get to 2014, so 15 years further on, um, crystallising that pot of um, assets that's <coughs> left, or converting that pot rather into an annuity at that point in time, and seeing whether there's more left to, to buy a bigger annuity, um, or less left, and, and the annuity is smaller than had you annuitized in the first place. So, what, what, does the, uh, what do the results of the game say? Well, in 1999, you um, would have been better off annuitizing across the board, irrespective of the kind of portfolio, so equity, mix, or fixed interest. <coughs> 2009, more likely that uh, going to draw down, benefiting from more buoyant markets, and then annuitizing later would have been a, a, a better strategy. Who knows? That's the thing, isn't it? <laughs> it depends on the market. And I think that's the key thing, that, that there are different scenarios and it starts to draw out for people that there is no one, no one right answer. Um, and uh, hence the importance of some of the modeling techniques to help people understand the dynamics. So that's just a little simple um, modeling test that we did. So we're going to have to move on to just touch on modeling tools and um, there'll be a lot more around this in, in, the, in the conference. Um, to me, there is no one answer, and it, it's really around um, what you feel your clients will understand best. Different clients, as we've seen, as we've gone through some of the data, different customers are at different levels of understanding. Some have thought carefully about what income they need, some, some haven't got a clue, haven't thought about it, uh, and some will be more, more aware than others in terms of some of the other dynamics. So, th there are different techniques, <coughs> from stochastic, the key for me is that we help people understand there is no one answer, there is a degree of variability. Um, another factor really independent or provider, and we at Aviva completely respect um, use of independent <coughs> tools and, and use that frequently with our, our offerings. Um, but there are times when providers can help um, and independent tools are, 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 are perhaps uh, more expensive. So I think there's a, a, a healthy marketplace will emerge for both. Um, as they have in a number of a number of other places. Now this is not a sales pitch, but the guys have got a um, a stand outside where you can start to see some of our emerging thinking. Uh, in Q2, we will have available um, our first tool for helping people work with their clients, helping advisors work with their clients on um, retirement income choices. So the guys. 
will be happy to show you something. I'm interested in your thoughts, actually, about what works and what doesn't work. Um, I have also, is Dave Robson in the room? Uh, Dave. So Dave's here from Viva Investors and, and, and is also keen um, to, um, to show you some of our, our new fund packages as well that we have available in this space um, in Ewan, Ewan Monroe's new Ames Income Fund. Um, so if you're interested in, in that, there's some, some information on that available as well through Dave. So a few things to look at in the breaks. Okay, so I'm just going to close really on that. Um, again, in the spirit of, of making this up as we go along, I'm not quite sure I've done exactly what Abraham said I was going to do. Um, but hopefully it sets the backdrop, some interesting uh, information around how people are feeling right now uh, in the marketplace. Um, it is a time of change and of transformation. Um, I think we're seeing a mixture in terms of customers, how confident and confused they are. But also some encouraging signs about how people do value um, advice and can make use of advice. So um, I do think um, we should let the customer have the last word. And so um, I'm going to go back to Winston Churchill again. Um, and given all this backdrop, given the great need for advice, hundreds of thousands of people going through this, um, given the fact that you can see negative trust, there's a great opportunity for us. And let's make the new tax year and all we can do our finest hour. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. I'm not sure if um, Churchill will be delighted by so many quotes um, of him and, um, and, um, and, and the connection to Aviva. Um, he might be singing and dancing in his grave or just turning and thinking, oh God. Um, um, but thank you very much for that. I think that set the scene really for, um, you know, for um, some of... I think there's a seat over there. Sorry. Okay. Yes. You know, that, that set the, the scene, really, for, or the foundation, really, for some of the um, other presentations that we've got coming up. Um, and I think it's, it's, um, it's encouraging to see that consumers, consumers believe that it's better, you know, most people, I think, um, agree that it's better to take advice from financial <coughs> professionals than from... Um, you know, from family and friends, especially, especially um, on, on retirement. Um, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, but before I do that, I want to make sure that we've got the, um, the computer set, because it's going to take a bit of work, so do you want to... Now, I'll tell you a bit about Michael Kitsis. Actually, I'll tell you a lot about him. <laughs> um, when I when I, um, I I came into financial services right you know after my after my master's degree in Coventry um, I, I got a job in financial services and I and I that was 2006 and I joined the RBS um, and I had two weeks of training two weeks of training I said I was sent off to Bansley somewhere um, two weeks of training and then I um, got put in the field with an experienced um, advisor, and, and I, I was asked to shadow them for a few weeks. And then after that, I was put in front of customers, you know, essentially selling funds and protections and, and pension. After probably three weeks of training and FPC. Now, I, wouldn't, I, I, I don't like to go into how many of those clients have since complained about, about what they were sold um, you know, a, a few years ago. But around about 2010, 2011, um, I decided that I'd, I'd had enough of um, bank insurance and I was going to go into, into the, to the, to the IFA world. And um, I discovered this wonderful thing called Twitter around that time. And I found this guy on Twitter called Michael Kitsis. And I found his website. And he just seemed to know everything about financial planning and retirement income planning and modeling. <laughs> but more importantly, um, his, his blog for me was a window, if you like, 
to so much, um, so many other resources and so many other, you know, academic papers and research about what we were doing in financial services. And, and for me, it, it was, well, why didn't anyone tell me this stuff before they let me lose on those poor souls? Um, you know, several years ago, and 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 that's how much um, I value Michael's um, views on on all things financial planning. Really, uh, Michael is um, you know is a very experienced planner and is the director of research at Pinnacle Advisory Group, which is a U.S. based. Um, what they call RIA with um, nearly 1.5 billion of asset under management um, and um, you know a speaker in a lot so many industry events in the US I think last I checked Michael you speak at around 50 conferences a year I, I don't know how, how the guy manages to sleep um, but um, um, apparently he tells me he gets he, he gets six hours of sleep on a regular basis. So I give you my focuses. Thank you, Abraham. Welcome, everyone. It's, uh, it's great to be here. I'm enjoying kind of first trip out to the UK and uh, uh, very fascinated actually with, uh, with Tim's data and some of what he was talking about. You know, there are interesting parallels and differences in what's happening in the retirement space in the US versus what's happening here uh, in the UK, you know, we're a bit larger in population overall, including where our baby boomer post World War II cohort is. So we're actually at the point now, uh, 10,000 people a day turn 65 in the US and will every day for the next 15 years. So it is a massive focus around retirement in the US. At the same time, some really interesting differences in cultural attitudes. So we have long had the opportunity to. Uh, transition our assets out of pension plans over to retirement accounts as well as accumulating dollars in retirement accounts. And when you actually look at the U.S. space, uh, for people who already have assets that they are managing themselves, the percents that actually go back and choose to annuitize it is about 2%. So in the U.S., like, we view it as our God-given right to blow ourselves up in retirement however ineffectively we can. <laughs> Uh, you know, we also have some unusual attitudes and habits. Um, I had actually gotten someone when I told them I was coming out here who sent me this and asked me if this is an accurate reflection of breakfast in the U.S. Uh, the answer is no, we would have more eggs. <laughs> Three eggs minimum and they would be scrambled. Uh, but it, it, it leads to interesting differences around um, longevity as well. Amazingly enough, we actually survive despite the fact that we eat this very regularly. Uh, with very similar statistics that Tim had showed earlier around the longevity in retirement and particularly the longevity in retirement for people who have tended to save and are a little more affluent in the first place, who tend to have greater life expectancies. So that, th this kind of trend in the U.S. as well as here in the U.K. towards we're accumulating all these assets, we now have either for the first time or for a long time the ability to accumulate large lump sums and then we have to figure out what the heck to do with it has fueled a lot of research around retirement and what it looks like. And what I'm going to talk to you today about primarily is a thread of research that's been running in the U.S. now for almost exactly 20 years uh, that's broadly called uh, safe withdrawal rates. Uh, I'm curious, how many of you have heard of safe withdrawal rates 4% rule? That's kind of the names that I bounce around with. So I'm going to talk a little about the origin of where exactly it is that that came from how it came forth, where we came up with that number, as well as a little bit of what it would actually look like if you applied some of the same research here in the UK. Now when I look at the, the same withdrawal rate question, like the most basic level, we're usually just trying to answer one or two fairly fundamental client questions. The first one usually goes something like this. Um, I've been saving and accumulating for a bunch of years. I save money in various types of accounts. I've accumulated a pretty good pile of assets. I've got some retirement accounts. I've got some investment accounts. I've got all this money. I don't really want to work anymore. I'm trying to figure out how I translate pool of money into sustainable stream of cash flows for the rest of my life. Which is not an entirely clear and an intuitive solution about what to do. The easiest one, I can go buy a bunch of bonds, fixed income investments, just take my coupon checks for the rest of my life. That works relatively well for short-term time periods, doesn't work so well for long-term time periods because inflation becomes a very significant problem. 
So then I've got to layer in something that's got a bit of growth to handle the inflation. So I start putting something like equity shares into my portfolio. Now I've got another cash flow stream. Dividends are going to start cutting me checks over time. They generally grow over time, helps to keep pace with inflation. I get some capital appreciation as well. But now the picture gets a lot messier because now I'm trying to draw from interest, from dividends, and from capital gains. And of course, for at the end of the day, while I don't want to run out of money too soon, my goal is not necessarily to live like a pauper and leave a giant pile of money to my children. So at some point, I need to figure out how to tap at least some of the principal as well. And by the time you're trying to mix all those buckets together, how do I tap the interest and the dividends and the capital gains and the principal, which of course all is volatile, particularly once I put equity shares in there, could it's moving up and down, makes this a really complex question. Now for others, they come at it from a little bit of the opposite direction. These are the ones that say, look, I've been going through, I've, I've got a sense as to what my retirement is going to be. I know where I'm going to be living. I know what I'm going to be doing. I know what lifestyle I'm going to be maintaining. Maybe I figured that out on own. Maybe I figured that out by working with you as my advisor. So I know about what it costs on an ongoing annual basis to fund my retirement. I know what the cash flow need is. What I don't know is how much money do I need the big bucket in order to make that work. And really, it's just opposite sides of the same coin, right? So we have a pool of money, and we're trying to figure out what the cash flows are, or I've got a cash flow goal, and I'm trying to figure out what the pool of money would be in order to make it work. That's all that we're really trying to do with uh, the whole safe withdrawal rate research question, is figure out how to build that link once we mix together interest, dividends, capital gains, and the expectation that eventually I'm going to tap some of this principle as well, because I don't need to die with all of it left over. Now, here's how we would have analyzed it historically. So how would we have done it historically? We would plug it in a financial planning software and see what it looks like. Basically, we'd plug it into a giant spreadsheet. That's what we did before even as financial planning software. So if I look at the research going back 20, 30, 40 years ago, the way we answer this question is pretty straightforward. You're 65 year old, we're just going to plug in your spending for 30 years, see how it turns out. Right? It can take long-term market returns. Uh, our classic U.S. data, I think, is fairly similar here. Uh, we tend to do long-term projections with inflation, something around 3%, give or take a little. Long-term return on equities in the U.S. is about 10% over the past 100 years. Long-term return on uh, bonds, fixed income investments is about 5 So if I have a balanced portfolio, 60% stocks, 40% bonds, I get about an 8% return. If I give them a, a million-dollar portfolio just to make the math nice and round and easy, I get a chart that looks something like this. <coughs> So the yellow line is the client spending. It starts out at about sixty something thousand dollars a year. It increases each year by three percent inflation. So by the end, I'm spending about one hundred and sixty a year to maintain the same standard of living. Inflation is pretty rough. The red line is the account balance. So it starts out at a million dollars. In the early years, we actually build a little bit of a cushion because we start out spending only about sixty something thousand, but we're earning eight percent, which means we're making eighty thousand. So we build a bit of a cushion in the first half of retirement. Then about halfway through, we hit that crossover point. We start winding the portfolio back down. We wind it down the second half of retirement. Of course, the spend down gets more rapid at the end because inflation-adjusted spending is starting to really pressure the portfolio. But, but we make it to the end. And classically, you want to figure out if you have a reasonable retirement. This is pretty much how we did it. And the conclusion was really straightforward. If the red line made it to the end, things are good. <laughs> if the red line hits zero too early, you have a problem. So you have to move on the four fundamental levers of retirement spending. Save more, spend less, retire later, die sooner. <laughs> those are the only four that work. Some combination of those will either get your red line to the right place, or with the last one, if you just die early enough, you don't have to worry about running out of money because you ran out of life first. But that was the pretty straightforward approach. We plugged in the numbers, we looked at how it worked. Most of us would have uh, projections that would look something like this. Uh oh, my clicker appears to be not cooperating with me. Oh, this year. Uh oh. I think your computer froze. Oh, there we go. All right, it's coming back to life. Maybe, sort of. I'll let you take these. So, at the same time, we would also often have a chart that looks something like, oops, sorry. <coughs> Too far. Oh, now it's click picking up all my clicks at once. There we go. So uh, a lot of times we'd also have a chart that looks something like this. I know the, the numbers are a little bit small for you to read, which isn't really a problem. The, the format should be familiar. So we just count the years from 1 to 30. Uh, the first column is your account balance at the beginning of each year. The second column is your growth. The third column, which sorry, I washed out a little bit in the coloring here, is your withdrawals. And the fourth column is your end of your account balance. So 
Starting balance plus growth minus withdrawals equals ending your balance. Almost every financial planning software package out there still has something like this. Maybe you got a couple extra lines for taxes and some pensions or social security systems, uh, country by country. But we all basically have a ledger style projection like this. And it really comes to the same fundamental conclusion. You walk clients through a few lines, and then every human being does the same normal thing. They go to the bottom right hand corner and see how much money they have on the field. Right? And it's the same fundamental conclusion. If you get down here and there's a bunch of zeros, you have a problem. Spend less, save more, retire later, die sooner. If you get down here and you have a large account balance left over, things are looking pretty good. And now most people who've been in this and uh, practicing for a while have realized that the other caveat of doing retirement projections like this is if you've been in the business for a while, you may have noticed not all of your clients actually promptly die on their 95th birthday. <laughs> so some people might want a little bit of a reserve left over, right? I don't exactly want to see you go to zero at the end. I hope you have one year of spending or three years of spending or 200,000 or 400,000, but we all have some maybe some reserve number left over, but we're still basically getting in the same place, which is we plug in the numbers, we plug in our long-term growth projections, our long-term inflation projections, we crunch out the numbers, we see how you do as long as you make it to the end, your retirement's looking pretty good. And if you actually back into that number with long-term historical data, what you find is you end up spending about 6.6% of your account balance in the first year, adjusted upwards each year for inflation, and you get a number that works over a 30-year time period. Now, the caveat to this is we're not just assuming that you get long-term returns over the 30-year time horizon. We're actually assuming you get the exact average return each and every year of your retirement. So not just that a balanced portfolio averages out to about 8% over time, but since computers are really, really accurate, technically we're projecting that you're going to earn 8.0000000000% each and every year in your retirement, even though markets have never actually done that in any particular year around any country around the globe. Right? We've never gotten exactly 8.0. We've gotten close a couple times. So we can look at what happens with the same kinds of projections if we start introducing a little bit of volatility. And I'm going to do this by introducing just the smallest amount of volatility to start. I'm still going to assume that stocks average 10 and bonds average 5. But instead of doing st same straight ride returns every year, I'm going to assume there are two years where you earn 20, two years where you earn zero, two 20s, two zeros, still average out to 10. I'm still going to give you 10% in all the intervening years on stocks. I'm still going to give you 5% on bonds. So we're not even getting into real world volatility in bear markets yet. Just two really good years, two really bad years. Everything else smooths out. Well, here's what happens if you get two good years at the beginning. Things look very different. You get two good years up front. You get a little bit further ahead than you were supposed to be. Now you start earning your 8% average portfolio growth on that, but because you're further ahead, you build a cushion even longer. You don't reach a crossover point where you start spending down until you're already into your mid to late 80s, and by then you don't have that much time horizon left until you run out. So it really turns out just fine. This is the same chart as I made it perfectly to the end, spending last dollar in the last year, and now suddenly I have 100% of my principal left over. And all I did was change for, well, really four years of retirement. I gave you two good returns at the beginning, and as you can see, I gave you two bad returns at the end. The, the line does turn down a little bit more sharply in the end. Now, this is what happens when you get the good returns up front. This is what happens when you get the bad returns up front. So I give you two zeros out of the gate. Now, you're getting two 0% returns on stocks. You've still got 40% of your portfolio in bonds. Your total return is actually two. But you're earning two, you're withdrawing six and a half. So you draw down your portfolio almost 10% in the first two years. So by year three, you're down to 900. You're earning 8% on 900, which means you're earning 72. Your spending started out at 66. You got a couple of years worth of inflation adjusted spending. You're already spending 72. And so now suddenly your, your line begins at slow, steady decline, not halfway through your retirement, but basically in year three. And at that point, it's only a matter of time before you run out of money, which you do. And it's not trivial you run out about six or seven years short. So getting two zeros at the beginning, you are 20% short of your retirement goal. It's not like, oh, you got a rocky start. Maybe you'll have to tighten your belt at the end. Two zeros at the beginning, you're flat broke, six years short of your goal. And the painful thing, although you can't really see it here, you really do get two 20% returns at the end. You're just compounding them on the account balance of zero. <laughs> but I promise, if you looked at the underlying spreadsheet, you would see zero dollars times 20% for each of these two years. <laughs> and that becomes the fundamental problem that we deal with around retirement spending, and why it's such a problem to just assume straight line projection long-term average returns. Because even if you average out the long-term return, if you get a bad sequence of returns at the beginning, you don't have any money left when the good returns finally show up. 
And that really becomes the focal point. It doesn't matter if you average out in the long run if you don't have any money left when the good returns finally show up. And again, this scenario and this scenario have the exact same average annual growth rate down to the 17th decimal place. They both average out. For everyone that says, don't worry about the market volatility, these things average out over time. Anybody ever said something like that to their clients? The returns may average out. Your portfolio does not. Because you're taking cash flows out. If I didn't touch the portfolio, it really does average out. But once I'm taking cash flows out, I introduce a new problem, which is this phenomenon where a bad sequence means I've run out of money before the good returns show up. That becomes the challenge. Now, this is kind of the extreme version because I actually assume you got the bad returns at the beginning and the good returns at the end, which means you did actually have to wait 26 years to average out. Now, if you get a sharp downturn and you bounce back, here's what it looks like. So I get two zeros at the beginning and I get two 20s immediately thereafter. So this is more like what well, you know, financial crisis kinds of things, what we've seen. Sharp downturn, sharp bounce back. When you get a sharp downturn and a sharp bounce back, it actually doesn't hurt that much. You run out one year early. You're a little bit off. It's actually not such a big deal. And this is actually one of the key takeaways around sequence of return risk that I find is still not really sinking in around the globe as we get used to this. It's actually not situations like the global financial crisis that introduce sequence of return risk. The downturn was very sharp and severe, but the recovery was as well. And when the recovery actually bounces back fast enough, this is a really negligible difference at the end. I mean, yes, technically we ran out of money one year short, but obviously with this level of volatility, we have 20, 24 other years to do this as well. And there's lots of ways that we can get back on track. So it's actually not single year sharp downturns that are problems. It's extended periods of mediocre returns. It's not bad years, it's bad decades. And it doesn't actually take much of a bad decade. You just have to get a flat one. Take 10 years of ongoing withdrawals from a portfolio that's flat, and you've dug down a very, very deep hole that you can't recover from. It's not actually the market returns that are digging the hole. It's the ongoing withdrawals a little bit at a time that cumulatively adds up to a lot. So even when I look back in places like our US space, our retirees that started in 2008 right before the financial crisis are actually looking fine. It's the ones who started back in 2000 that have a problem. Because for them, they went eight years, our S&P 500 hit 1,500 in 2000. It fell back, it hit 1,500 again in 2008. We went through the global financial crisis, it hit 1,500 again in 2013. So they went 13 years without making a dime of capital appreciation in the markets. That sequence risk, where I go through half my retirement, I haven't made any money yet. Clipped a little bond coupons, but that's not fueling my retirement growth. Now, I won't give you all the gory numbers around it, but we find that inflation has a very similar phenomenon as well. So inflation, it turns out, is really sensitive to two pieces. One, your long-term projections, projections are highly sensitive to just the absolute level of inflation and what it turned out to be. So if I had redone those projections that you looked at, but instead of getting 3% inflation, I got 3.5% inflation, so the yellow line crept just ever so slightly higher, my 30-year portfolio runs out of money in 26 years. Half a percent inflation cost me four years of a shortfall. Now, if I'm wrong the other direction, I thought I was going to get 3% inflation, it only turns out to be two and a half, so the yellow line doesn't quite creep up as much, I don't withdraw as much from my portfolio. My 30-year portfolio actually goes 35 years. So a half a percent inflation over a 30-year time horizon is a nine-year swing on a 30-year portfolio. Think about that. Half a percent of inflation is a nine-year swing in the sustainability of a 30-year portfolio. Anybody highly confident in their inflation projection within half a percent over the next 30 years? <laughs> 10 years, six months. Now the combination effects get even nastier. So I'm gonna do one more of these, uh, one more version of these numbers for you, but instead of looking at uh, basically 100 years of market history in the US, I'm gonna look at 30 years. I'm gonna pick a particular 30 year time period. So we're gonna look at the time period in the US from 1969 to 1999. And I'm going to assume that you sit down with your client in advance and you have an actual functioning crystal ball that tells you with 100% accuracy exactly what the returns are going to be for the next 30 years. So you sit down with your client, it's 1969. First, you give them the bad news. Inflation over the next 30 years is going to be 5.3%. That's a lot of inflation. I'll show you in a minute just how much it adds up. Inflation is going to be 5.3% for the next 30 years. <coughs> Equities 
just based on large cap U.S. stocks, are going to do 13.4%. Bonds, just based on our intermediate sovereigns, are going to do 8.6%, which means your 60-40 balanced portfolio, if we just annually rebalance it for 30 years, is going to do 11.5%. Now, it's kind of depressing by today's standards. I don't know about uh, here, but in our country, you would actually get sued today if you did a 30-year projection assuming a balanced portfolio is going to do 11.5%. It's so far outside of the norm, you would be uh, liable for it. Yet, fortunately, we have our functioning crystal ball, and we actually know for a fact this will happen. This really is what happened. This is true U.S. history. Astounding time period to be an investor. 11.5% on 60-40 portfolio. Real return after you back out the inflation is still north of 6%. Astounding time period to be an investor. So if you do your retirement projection... You get a chart that looks something like this, similar to the yellow and red line I'd shown you before, although if I overlaid it, you would find a few differences. The first is, the yellow line, thanks to 5.3% inflation, creeps up a lot higher. You start out at about 70 something thousand dollars a year, you finish at 350000 a year just to maintain the same standard of living. 5.3% inflation is brutal. These are the kinds of scenarios where the cars at the end cost as much as the houses at the beginning. <laughs> Astoundingly high numbers. This client ends up spending a million dollars in just the last three years from a portfolio that starts at a million and has to go the first 27 years before you spend a million on inflation adjusted spending in just the last three. Fortunately, the good news is that's really easy to do when you get 11.5% on 60-40 portfolio. So they do just fine. The portfolio starts at a million. It actually grows as high as about 1.6 because they have to build a bigger cushion for how high the inflation adjusted spending is at the end. But they do it, they make it, they get to the end. Since we have our perfectly functioning crystal ball, we know exactly how to do this. So we've run the numbers. We can back into it and figure out with confidence. You can spend $74,000 a year in the first year, adjusted each year for 5.3% inflation. We already know it look, works because we did our long-term projections with our functioning crystal ball. And then if you live it in the real world, this is your retirement. <laughs> That's real world volatility and inflation. You really do average out to 11.5% on a 60-40 portfolio. Unfortunately, you get there by earning about 2% for the first 12 years and 18% for the rest. And you just barely manage to go broke in year 12. You started in 1969. The greatest bull market of the century in the U.S. ran 1982 to 1999. It was actually the greatest simultaneous bull market in stocks and bonds at the same time, which is how you got 18% on balance portfolios through that time period. And you just barely ran out of money before the greatest bull market happened. And that's what we really deal with in the world of sequence risk. This was our 73-74 bear market, which was our second worst of the century. And basically, once you go through the 73-74 bear market, you cut your portfolio in half and your inflation is ramping up to double digits, you have no chance of recovery. And so once again, we get the distinction with sort of the stark reality of real world. Average returns, this worked. I knew for a fact from what the average returns is going to be. Average returns, this worked. Real world volatility, you're flat broke in 12 years. And you're basically doomed after six. Now, this is a bad sequence, although it's actually not the worst. There are some slightly worse time periods that look even uglier than this in the U.S. historical data. As it turns out, though, this has also one of been one of the most fantastic periods to retire if you just have the great fortune of living it in reverse. <laughs> right? So you start with 1999. You start with the good returns for the first half of your retirement. And then you wind it down. Now, it's not what a lot of retirees think. So if I went to Tim, I said, Tim, here's how your retirement's going to go. First half's going to feel great. Inflation's modest, stock returns are high, bond returns are high. But when you turn 80, which I find for a lot of clients is like that, that point of no return, like whatever your lifestyle is by 80, you ain't changing it at that point. So when you turn 80, the market's going to crash 45% and will not recover for the rest of your life. You might think that you want to go hide in bonds, but that won't work because bonds are going to go through the worst bear market of the century, and they will not recover for the rest of your life. And while you're trying to manage through all this, inflation is going to go from 2 to 12. So I'm going to hit Tim with pretty much 
the worst possible of everything that can hit a retiree all at once in your 80s when there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. This is how his retirement goes. I guess in real time, when he starts out at a million dollars and his portfolio comes back from 10 to 7.5, it will feel traumatic. But he's not exactly failing. And this is actually a sequence of return risk in reverse. The bad scenarios are actually so bad that it doesn't matter how good the returns are later, you can't recover. When you get the good returns up front, you actually get so far ahead, it doesn't matter how bad you hit them at the end, they can't fail. You might take a chunk out of his inheritance. I guess his kids will be unhappy when they only inherit $8 million instead of 10. <laughs> but considering he retired with one, did okay. So sequence of return risk actually ends up magnifying in both directions. We tend to talk about it in terms of the bad version, but it's important to understand the good version as well. When you get a good start, you actually can't break your retirement at the end. When you get a bad start, you can't recover from it. And it cuts both ways. And I won't give you all the gory math to it, but suffice to say, the greater the volatility that you introduce, the more the sequencing actually matters. The more volatility, the more you can deviate from your expected returns in the short term while you're taking withdrawals, the more dramatically different the returns, are, or I should say, the dollar wealth comes out to be in the long run. So in the U.S., this, this led to a line of research that's now broadly called the safe withdrawal rate research. And the idea of the research was to step back and say, all right, I get that these numbers work when you get nice long-term averages. But as we've just seen, it's kind of dangerous to rely on the averages. What happens instead when you start looking at what real-world volatility would have been like instead? And the research came forth from an article that came out in the Journal of Financial Planning in 1993 by a uh, financial planner and former engineer named Bill Bengen. In fact, he was a former engineer, not a coincidence. All right, what engineers are trained to do? You stress test things. And that was basically what he was trying to do. So the reigning view around retirement of the day when Bingham was doing his work in 1993, we were about 12 years into our wonderful bull market in the U.S. So prominent uh, investment folks in the U.S. were saying, well, you know, since stocks and bonds and balanced portfolios have been doing about 10 to 15 percent for the past decade, we think a conservative spending level would be that you only spend 8 percent. That was conservative in 1993. Only do eight, maybe seven if you're hyper-conservative. And Bain's commentary was, all right, well, I, I get that would look great over the past 10 years because markets have been wonderful, but if we go a little bit back further in history, things weren't always so great. And in fact, if you get bad sequencing, you get a real problem. So Bain's solution was, say, instead of looking at what market returns have been doing going forward or projecting the solid spreadsheets, Let's actually go back through market history. We got pretty good data in the U.S. going back to the early 1900s. Let's go back through the history and see what kinds of withdrawal rates would have worked through actual market sequences. So what would have worked given the actual sequence of stock and bond returns and inflation that you got, say, through the 60s and 70s, which was the time period we looked at, or through the Great Depression? And so we produced a chart that looks something like this. Now, this I actually recreated with uh, uh, a different data set. Bengen originally used the data from Ibbotson, now Morningstar. This is actually data that uh, uh, done by uh, Robert Schiller. <coughs> different data set, but almost exactly identical conclusion. So what you're looking at here, each tiny little red bar is the withdrawal rate that would have worked going all the way back to the 1870s. So this very first narrow little red bar is the withdrawal rate that would have worked from 1871 to 1900 inclusive. So you retire in 1871, you get the actual sequence of stock and bond returns that occurred for a 60-40 portfolio annually rebalanced. You take withdrawals based on the actual inflation that occurred, and your goal is simply to spend through the portfolio, run out the end. So we start with an initial withdrawal rate, and that year it would have been about 9.5%. So for every million dollars, you spend $95,000. You adjust it each year for inflation, regardless of actual market returns. So market's going to bounce around. We assume you take a stable standard of living for life. And you would have made it to exactly the end. Now, 1971 is actually a pretty good time period for the U.S. It was part of our Reconstruction era, our move west across the country. Massive growth, massive industrialization of the country. <coughs> 
we kind of go up and down through various time periods. We go all the way out until basically the mid-1980s, last bar on the chart, running from 1985 to 2014. That's the last one I can do. I don't know how 30-year retirement is going to go for someone who retired in 1986, because they haven't gone 30 years yet. Obviously, you've got to agree with guess since we're about 29 and a quarter years, but we end the chart in the mid-1980s because we're only running 30-year time periods where we've actually seen the whole 30 years. So we get a really wide range of results. The average across the whole chart, 6.5% which actually is pretty much the same withdrawal rate that you get if you just use long-term average returns and project it on a straight line, 6.5%. But the focus for Bangin wasn't necessarily that the average withdrawal rate that would have worked historically was 6.5 or that the withdrawal rate based on average returns was 6.5. Bangin's focus was the low points. How bad does it get? So we have three different eras of this in the U.S. People who retire in the late 1960s, so we got that period that I gave Tim at the end of his retirement running in reverse. So 45% market decline in equities, double-digit inflation, which of course completely crashed the bond market at the exact same time that the stock market got crushed. High inflation drove your spending up dramatically. And it turned out when you went through all of that, if you actually had any money left by the time you got to the early 1980s, you had that amazing bull market. You just had to make sure you had some money left. And so the withdrawal rate that would have worked if we backed into that number was about 4 to 4.5%. That would have been low enough that while you would have partially depleted your portfolio in the first half of your retirement, you would have had enough left for the good returns at the end to make it work. Now the second time period where you get low points is through the Great Depression. Market decline was actually worse. The U.S. top to bottom market decline from the peak in 1929 to the trough in 1932 was over 85%. The good news, if you can call it that, the good news in this environment, though, was that we had deflation. Now, from the uh, economic perspective, deflation is really, really bad. Get your economy stuck. You can't get it going again. Lots of research that came out of the Great Depression about the phenomenon of deflation and what happens. From the retiree's perspective, though, it's actually kind of good news. It means while at least your portfolio is going down, your retirement is getting cheaper, and you have to spend less and less to maintain the same standard of living. And it actually, that and diversification into government bonds which do especially well in deflationary environments, really helps to ameliorate the damage. And so the withdrawal rate that we come out with through the Great Depression is actually a very similar 4 to 4.5% withdrawal rate. It would have been low enough that you would have gotten through the early pain of the Great Depression and had enough money left over after World War II was over and the world began its rebuilding process that you would have made it through the end. Now, the third time period is actually an interesting one in the U.S. It's for people who would have retired in 1907. So, retiring in, so 1907, early 1900s in the U.S. was sort of the capstone for all the massive growth that we were having through the late 1800s. So, this was the boom of the U.S. This was our move west over the entire massive land mass that we have. Uh, this was our transition from basically an agricultural economy to an industrial economy. This was our from the farm to uh, the city's transition. <coughs> Huge boom in the U.S., massive growth, massive building construction. We're building factories, we're building houses, we're building everything we possibly can every place until eventually we got to the point where we accidentally went and built more houses than there were factory workers to buy them. <laughs> and they were getting really pricey. And so eventually the housing activity had to slow down. Housing activity slowed down, people started getting laid off. People started getting laid off, the buying activity slowed down. The buying activity slowed down, the factories had to slow down how much they were producing. Factories slowed down how much they were producing, factory workers started getting fired. Factory workers started getting fired, they couldn't make the mortgages on their houses, so they started defaulting on their houses. Banks foreclosed on the houses, found out there was no one to sell it to because there was too much housing inventory and everybody was unemployed. So they sold into a declining housing market, which of course accelerated the decline of the housing market, until eventually the banks started to go under. So local banks started to go under. People figure out that their local banks were starting to go under, so they would line up at the bank to get their money out, which would guarantee that the local bank would go under. <laughs> we had no federal system to back the banking system back then. So the local banks started failing. As the local banks failed, they started causing the regional banks to fail, because they were basically holding companies from the small banks. The regional banks started failing until eventually the national banks started failing as it went all the way up the line until we got to a point in the fall of 1907 where literally the major Wall Street firms would not lend to each other in the overnight market because they were afraid that they would open the newspaper the next morning and find out that their counterparty was out of business. Sound vaguely familiar to anybody? <laughs> 
National real estate decline leads to massive financial crisis. All right, it was almost the exact same formula. The only difference is, while the one that we went through in 2008 basically started at the top of the financial system and went down to Main Street, the one in 1907 basically started in Main Street and went up instead because the banking system was structured a little bit differently back then. Now, the aftermath that we ultimately had from that, uh, we were going through a series in the, in the fall of 1907 where it, it was like dominoes in the financial system. Because we didn't have the backstops then that we do today, we really were going through a process where banks would do, each, do their normal counterparty lending, someone would go out of business. You find out they're out of business, that means all your loans to them are defaulting, which means your balance sheet is uneven, now you're out of business a week later. You go out of business, you take out the bank that was lending with you. They go out of business, they take out the bank that was lending with them, and it was rippling through the entire system. So the way we ultimately averted it in 1907 was J.P. Morgan, who had more money than anybody in the country or the world at the time, put $10 million of his own money into the next bank that was failing to stop the dominoes. And it basically stopped the crisis on the spot. The origin of our Federal Reserve came forward six years later because we realized J.P. Morgan might not be around the next time that we did it, although ironically his company was and had an interesting role in the crisis. We created the Federal Reserve to kind of back that system uh, for the next time that it happened. But the aftermath to it was frankly very similar to what we're already seeing now. We, we'd done so much economic damage by the time we finally stopped the financial crisis that we spent about a decade with low single-digit interest rates, extremely mediocre growth, lousy market returns, and you went through that for basically 15 years until the booming 1920s lifted it up again. And when we went through that time period, we actually got to almost exactly the same number. The withdrawal rate that would have worked was about 4 to 4.5%. And the origin of Bangman's research was actually really straightforward. So he ran all these different numbers, he looked at all the different scenarios, how good it was, what the average was, what it looked like in the bad time periods, and when he said, I want to come up with a safe withdrawal rate, his conclusion, pick the smallest bar on the chart. That's it, that was the whole number. 4% rule, pick the worst bar on the chart. If you retire using that bar as your guy, one of two things will happen. You'll look through another time period like that, in which case you'll make it to the end, by definition, not much left, but you'll make it there. Or you'll live through any of the other bars, in which case the returns are better, and you'll either do one of two things. You'll die with a bajillion dollars left over, right, because you got, like, Tim's thing. You got, the good, you got the good returns with the bad one at the end, and it didn't ruin you. Or, more realistically, you'll sit down and do a review for your clients, you know, five, seven years into their retirement. You'll find out that the disaster is not occurring, and you'll tell them it's okay to lift your spending, because clearly you're way ahead of the bad scenarios that we were projecting. But that was the origin of the safe withdrawal rate. Let's just pick the worst bar on the chart and use that as a baseline. Literally, it was based on what's the worst case scenario we could find in U.S. history with all the data we have available. Now, this is U.S. specific, although it's since been starting to get replicated around the globe. Here's what it actually looks like in the U.K. So this is using the Dimson Marsh Stanton data, for those of you who are familiar with the data set. This is what would have worked going all the way back to 1900. So you actually see some interesting uh, parallels. You get some really nasty results right around 4% uh, withdrawal rates for people who retire in the early 1900s. In your case, this is driven primarily by the massive inflation spike that happened after World War I that compressed any safe withdrawal rate before World War I down to about 4%. You get a second low point through the Great Depression, and then you get a little bit of a dip in the mid-1960s, just as we did in the U.S., although yours doesn't dip down quite as far because your uh, damage from the inflation was not actually as bad in the 1970s here as it was in the US. So if you run the similar methodology in the UK, you tend to find safe withdrawal rates slightly lower than the US, although only slightly, about three and a half to four. Now the other interesting effect here is what happens with asset allocation. So the green bar is what you get for safe withdrawal rates across different asset allocations from 0% equities up to 100% equities in the US. So uh, our, your peak is right around uh, this 4 to 4.5% number. You get that in about 50, 50, or 60, 40 portfolios. If you go much more conservative than that, inflation ravages you. If you go too aggressive beyond that, you get market declines like the Great Depression. So the sweet spot really is in the middle where the rebalancing process helps to protect you a little bit from both sides. 
The blue bars are for the UK. Notably, as I said, your numbers are a little bit lower. The interesting thing, though, about your data, actually, um, it skews uh, towards heavier equity exposures here. Inflation has actually been more challenging here than it in, in the U.S., particularly, again, your uh, post-World War I inflation spike in particular. And so to the extent that equities prove to be a long-term hedge against inflation, your portfolio is actually fair better when you uh, skew a little bit more towards equities. And actually, the notable difference between the two, because of the damage of inflation, and sorry, the lines end up pretty close here. Uh, the bottom line is what happens when you use... Um, uh, UK stocks and uh, intermediate sovereigns. The higher blue line is actually what happens when you use UK equities and short-term uh, bills. So sovereigns with maturities under one year. You actually get slightly better results. And we've seen a similar phenomenon in the US. What ends up happening is in the time periods where really bad stuff happens, the last thing you want is to have bond losses on top of your stock market losses. So from the diversification perspective of just trying to stem the bad scenarios, the downside, if inflation, if, uh, if markets are good, bills are fine because the equities carry you. If markets get bad and inflation spikes, you want the bills because that's your cash to reinvest in equities when they're down and they don't get ravaged in the same way by rising interest rates. So it's an interesting dynamic. Wealth maximization, you want to own stocks and bonds. Risk minimization, you actually want to own stocks and bills. So as we look at this overall, what Bangin basically found was if the average withdrawal rate that works is about four to, uh, sorry, if the average withdrawal rate that works is about six and a half, the withdrawal rate you need to defend against bad market environments is more like four to four and a half. Basically, you take about a 30% haircut to your spending to defend against bad sequence risk. That's not a trivial haircut, but that's the haircut that you take to defend against bad market risk. And then obviously, if it turns out that the market doesn't actually do bad things, you'll have extra money left over, or you can lift your spending along the way. Balanced portfolios tend to fare well, in part because of the balancing effects between inflation and deflation. Your country tilts a little bit more towards inflation. It tends to favor your stocks a little more. We have more deflation in our market history. It tends to skew us a little bit more conservative. Now, there are a lot of adjustments that can be done to this as well. So the original research was fairly straightforward, plain vanilla. We assume you get gross index returns. There's no fees. There's no taxes. Uh, there's none of the other drags that happen in there in real life. All of these have actually been extended in the research for the past 20 years or so. And there's actually a really deep body of research now in the U.S. around how you can adjust these withdrawal rates for all these different factors. So if you've got some fees and taxes, you take them down a little. If you've got a shorter time horizon, you can lift it up a little. Greater diversification tends to lift it up. So almost all of the safe withdrawal rate data that you hear literally assumes you only own two asset classes, U.S. large cap stocks and intermediate U.S. government bonds. Obviously, most people in practice are more diversified in today's world, leads you to somewhat higher withdrawal rates. So people have more or less spending flexibility than others. If you're actually able to cut your spending in bad markets and make it up later in good markets, you can spend a little bit more. Not all clients are comfortable with that, right? We have the clients where we said if something really bad happened, would you be able to cut your spending? They're like, well, yeah, we can trim back a little. You know, we'll do fewer vacations or something. And then we have the other clients. If things were bad, would you be able to cut your spending? Like, oh my God, that'd be crisis. Can't change anything. All right, well, we're going to set you at the minimum baseline. So you can adapt this for client comfort levels. And these are basically the ranges that we actually see for all these different adjustment factors that are out there. So a few advisors in the U.S. now are starting to adopt this by literally kind of going through it almost like a, a questionnaire process with clients and layering additional adjustment factors on up and down. So we'll haircut you a little for your fees, we'll haircut you a little for your taxes, we'll give you more for your time horizon, your diversification, your spending flexibility, we'll move it up or down based on the initial market conditions. Lots of research actually going on now in the U.S. around what market conditions do to this. So if you retire when overall equity levels are cheap, you get much higher withdrawal rates. Because even, even a bad sequence when stocks are cheap is only so bad. Bad sequences are much worse when stocks are expensive. So the starting levels of the market when you actually retire are a surprisingly dramatic impact. Even though market valuation is pretty useless as a short-term predictor, it's very effective as a long-term one. So it's a big driver of withdrawal rates. 
All around now, what we actually see around this, if I can give you a snapshot of where the research is today in the U.S. So all this is now building around how do we manage this sequence of return risk, these possibilities that we get bad sequences followed by good ones, which means you get the average return you were expecting, but you don't get there in the order that you want. If you spend too much, you deplete in the early years, and you can't recover. So this is getting tackled from a couple of different directions. The first and kind of the starting point to it was the safe withdrawal rate research, which was simply to say, if you're really concerned about the sequence, just spend so little that you don't fail in any sequence. That's basically what 4% rule was. Just make your spending so low that you either get, you are either okay or you have extra money, which is a good trade-off. The second thread that's now coming forth is saying, well, maybe we can do this a little bit more effectively by adjusting spending along the way. Now, granted, as I mentioned earlier, there are a couple of clients where any adjustment to their spending is like a personal financial crisis for them, so you can't do that. But for most clients we find in practice, they can tolerate some spending adjustment. They don't really want to, but if we say, like, look, if it's the next Great Depression, do you think you could spend a little less? P.S. It's not like your friends are going to be eating out anyways because they're poor too. <laughs> All right, yeah, I guess we can tighten down a little bit. So spending flexibility helps. Some advisors in the U.S. are actually expanding this into actually creating decision rules. So very specific targets. Um, we're going to start your spending rate out at 5%. If it drifts higher than 6 which means your spending is outpacing your portfolio, you have to go through a cut. If it drifts down below 4 which means your portfolio is outpacing your spending, you can have a raise. So like we'll, we'll put rules in place, and you'll actually follow it. Like a system, you can do that with percentages, you can do that with Monte Carlo probability success, lots of different ways that's getting built. We actually see some people now beginning to create, just as you might have an investment policy statement that says how you're allowed to allocate and manage the portfolio, they're, they're literally creating withdrawal policy statements that dictate how you're going to draw from the portfolio. So which investments are you going to tap? Well, we're going to use uh, uh, equities when they're up. We're going to use cash when it's down. We're going to rebalance under these terms. We're going to take this much as a starting withdrawal. We're going to adjust it up if these things happen. We're going to adjust it down if these things happen. So they actually spell the whole thing out in policy. So when some market, chart ha market shock happens, everybody knows what the game plan is. Right? Market, market volatility is not some scary, unexpected thing. It's, look, you had a million bucks. According to our policy statement, if your portfolio crosses under 820, you're going to take a cut. Your cut will be 10%. We've already figured out what the 10% spending cut would be. You're going to trim back your restaurant budget a little, and you're going to take, uh, eliminate one vacation. So no stress. Don't need to worry. Just market volatility is going to bounce around. If you cross this line, we're going to do these changes. If you don't, we're not, and there's nothing else to worry about. And we've actually seen a lot of people say they are. Uh, I know a few advisors that were actually doing this through the financial crisis said so clients were massively easier to manage. Much, much, much easier. Because we don't realize it sometimes, but a lot, of the, a lot of the fear that you get from clients when they're going through times of market volatility is because they literally don't know where the line is between okay market volatility and it's a problem. Levels of market volatility. And we're usually not very good at telling them, frankly. You know, it's okay, it's okay, stay the course, stay the course. These things average out, all the things that we tell our clients, most of which is true and most of the time it is accurate, but they've still got that deep nagging feeling somewhere that says, all right, but clearly at some point it will actually be a problem. Right? Like obviously at some point the market will have fallen enough that's a problem. If you can't tell clients where that line is, they make it up in their own head. And they usually don't make it up very accurately. So when you actually set it forth and withdraw a policy statement, they know exactly where the line is and what the response would have to be. It takes the stakes down. Makes it much easier to manage through. And then the last uh, uh, body of research that we're actually seeing is different ways to manage the portfolio to go through this. So different ways to manage the asset allocation. I mean, obviously, any to the extent that you're just a better investor at alpha to the portfolio, more returns is more spending. But looking at other ways just to manage through the the liquidation of the spend down. So. Uh, the term in the U.S., I don't know how widely used it is here, equity glide paths. So what path will your equity exposure take throughout your retirement? So the traditional rule of thumb out there for most countries around the world, it seems, is the older you get, plus you own in equities. If I graph, graph your equity exposure through your lifetime, it basically does this as you get older. The problem that we actually find, though, from some of the research is that can be problematic. 
If you get a bad sequence, so you retire in an era like the mid-1960s or the uh, late 1920s, you got all the equity exposure at the beginning of your retirement, you take all the pain of the market decline, you get halfway through your retirement, the markets are now recovering, and you don't enjoy it because you've been taking equity exposure off the table through the decline. So you bear all the pain up front, you don't enjoy the recovery. If you actually want to do better from a retirement sustainability, we're actually finding it works better when you flip it around. So the portfolio actually gets a little bit more conservative in the early part of your retirement, and you layer equities back in in the second half. Not that you're necessarily going to take people 100% in equities, but if you imagine someone's lifetime asset allocation from you know, their 20s until their 90s, as opposed to a straight line that goes down, it looks more like the letter U. Or maybe the letter J. So it starts higher in you when you're young, it dips down when you retire, it comes back a little bit in your later retirement. That way, if you get a bad sequence at the beginning, you've buffered yourself, and you enjoy the recovery. If you get a good sequence, you just die with less extra money left over. Your kids get a slightly smaller and large inheritance, so they tend not to play very much. And then we also see a research right around more uh, dynamic or tactical asset allocation methods, so valuation-based things like if markets just get up to nosebleed levels, you just dial your equity exposure back by 15 or 20 percent. If they get super cheap, you overweight it. The rest of the time you leave it even, you end up with systems that are like, you only adjust your equity exposure twice a decade, but you actually can still improve sustainability of retirement income just by trying to chip away at some of the worst environments. Because what we find historically, even if I went back to that earlier chart that showed you all the different safe withdrawal rates back to the 1870s, those three low zones, the 60s, the 20s, and 1907, all three of them happened at record high valuations for equity markets, just based on overall equity valuations. So to that end, they were actually somewhat predictable. And likewise for uh, 2000 and 2008, were all record high market valuation levels. The other thing I would touch on and note here, just around the, the research that's going on. So first of all, while we're layering on all these different factors, I showed you a whole big list of them, we're still kind of deepening the research about how you layer them together and how they interact with each other. Um, all sorts of interesting interaction effects, like uh, ironically, the higher your taxes, the less the drag of fees, because your taxes actually sop up some of the fees. The higher your fees, the lower your, the impact of taxes, because you just don't grow as much with higher fees, so you don't pay as much taxes. <laughs> so there's all sorts of overlap effects. Uh, uh, there's lots of interesting overlap effects between diversification and spending rules as well, different ways to tap the portfolio to manage the spend down. So lot, lots of research still coming forward uh, in this space. Now probably the biggest caveat to it that I would note around just as a framework, it's really helpful for explaining to clients and just setting reasonable spending expectations. You know, if we go through this process with a client and talk to them about it, then we look at their spending, and they're spending like six and a half, it gets really clear how disconnected they are from reasonable uh, expectations, and it helps to manage their behavior a little bit. The caveat, though, is it doesn't work very well when they're, either their spending is uneven or their available income streams are uneven. So in the U.S., we get a couple of layers to this, both pensions out of the corporate system for the subset of people who still have them, and our Social Security, so our nationalized program, that's a, a, a layer for basically everyone. Pensions typically start at 65. Social Security, you can actually start anywhere between 62 and 70. And so particularly for someone like an early retiree, this gets really messy. So if I graph their withdrawal rate through their retirement, it's up here for seven years. Then they turn 62 and their spouse starts Social Security and their spending dips down a little. Their portfolio withdrawals dip down because Social Security is making up now. Then they do that for three more years, and the pension starts, and their withdrawals dip down a little bit further. Then they go five more years, then the other Social Security stream starts, and the withdrawals go down even further. But then the portfolio bears the brunt of all the inflation adjustments at the end, so the spending ramps up at the end. But we didn't do a withdrawal rate study for what's, your spend, what's the withdrawal rate if your spending pattern is like this. Right, because I have to do one if you're 55, and I have to do one if you're 66, and I have to do one if your ages are different uh, gaps apart. So we end up with kind of an infinite number of combinations. So the adoption in the U.S. about how you work around this ultimately is you do it through Monte Carlo analysis. And Monte Carlo analysis is now widely adopted as best practices in the U.S. because you capture all these market volatility phenomena, and it maps very well on the safe withdrawal rates. If you take a safe withdrawal rate style spending level and you run it through a Monte Carlo analysis, you're going to end up with something in the 95 to 99% range. 
but the Monte Carlo lets you graph all the kind of real world uneven cash flows from clients. The safe withdrawal rate research, for better or worse, was kind of built around just stable lifetime inflation adjusted spending, basically like as a pension replica. Except that doesn't always map well onto all the different income streams people have in practice. But as we wrap up here, I mean, certainly if there's one thing that you take away from this, I hope it's just to recognize this phenomenon of sequence of return risk, how dramatic it really gets with the kinds of real world volatility that you can see out there. And it becomes something that has to get managed as part of the retirement income picture. And it's unique to retirement income. If you don't have any cash flows coming out of the portfolio, sequencing doesn't matter. If you're a saver and you're still in the accumulation phase, technically the sequence of return risk is the reverse. You actually do best by having the bad results up front because you hardly save much anyways, yeah. And have the good returns at the end. Whereas in retirement, you want the exact reverse. You need the good returns at the beginning, and you want the bad ones at the end, and there's not enough time horizon left for you to care. Is, is the risk of sequences higher in accumulation than in drawdown? Pardon me? Is the risk of sequence of returns higher in accumulation that you don't reach the point you want to start to? Yeah, so some of, the, some of the research that's actually been extended in the uh, – the U.S. and one of my research partners named Wade Fowles has actually done a lot of work in this space. So obviously, kind of the, these these sequences of good and bad, um, you know, because of the momentum effects that we see in the market, tend to kind of occur in sequence, right? It's not like we get two random good years and two random bad years. We tend to get like amazing decade, horrible decade, amazing decade, horrible decade. And when we actually look throughout market history, we see this pretty consistently. The bulk of the majority of market returns in the long run are actually made about half the years. You know, now with 10 to 15 years of great returns, followed by 10 to 15 years of bad ones, great ones, bad ones, one chunk at a time after the other. Uh, uh, some researchers call these secular market cycles. So these like 10 to 20 year time periods where markets are just good and the tailwind is up, or markets are just bad and the, the headwind is against you throughout. And of course, in, in, in sequence then, because you get a good one and a bad one, it means if you've got a great run up in your savings in the accumulation years, it probably means you're about to have a miserable retirement sequence. And if you've had a terrible stint of market returns trying to finish your retirement savings, the good news is you're actually probably really cheap now, and you're going to have a great uh, return sequence in retirement. You're just not going to enter it with as much money as you thought. So it, it actually becomes a counterbalancing effect to some extent. So part of the research that Wade did a couple of years ago is he found, so if you just look at the withdrawal rates, they're really volatile. If you just look at like savings rates, the savings rates that you would need, those are also very volatile. When you pair the, the, the savings rates and the withdrawal rates together, they actually get more stable. Because the scenarios where you need to be a big saver because you get bad market returns tend to give you good returns in retirement, so you didn't need as much as you thought. And the ones that give you great returns, you retire with a huge account balance, except you get terrible returns in retirement, so it's a darn good thing you have a big account balance. So there actually is some uh, overlap effect there. But I, I suspect you're going to see more of these kinds of Safe withdrawal rate research and dynamic spending strategies start coming over here to the UK. Again, there's an interesting parallel just in the systems as well as some differences in how it's evolving here. In the US, we've had this flexibility. Uh, we've had flexibility to take pensions and move them into account balances for several decades now. And our whole system has actually been shifting for the past 15 years with fewer and fewer companies offering pensions at all and more and more just giving people savings accounts, tax preference savings accounts, a little bit of matching dollars and letting them do it on their own. So we've been going through that shift for a long time. You now have it as a one singular massive transition event all at once. So you're gonna have a whole lot of people asking questions a whole lot more quickly uh, because of the regulatory shift that's going on here. So interesting opportunity, I think certainly for anyone in the space here to become an expert at this stuff. And there's been a lot of research happening around the world to help with it. But I hope that's helpful. If, uh, if you want copies of any of the, the research material, I'll actually give you uh, a list of all the studies that, that were used in putting all this together. Um, we have the uh, handouts for it up on the site. So if you want a copy of this and then some of the other research that I've published, happy to share and make it available as well. But I hope this was helpful food for thought for you this morning. Thank you. Wow. Okay, so um, I'm going to take a, a couple of um, quick polls. Um, Show off and in the room, if you think that you have um, a robust framework with regards to managing spending, portfolio spending in, in retirement, 
and sequencing risk within your current investment <coughs> process if you think it's, it's robust enough? One, there's one going up and going down up, I'm sure. Two, okay. That sort of says it all. Okay, now who, anyone, Anyone agrees that we need to find ways to talk to clients about this without obviously scaring them off or, you know, this stuff. <laughs> Definitely not, 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 not Michael's slides, um, give that to But, but does, does anyone think, do, do you think, my question is, do you think that we need to find simpler, uh, more visual ways to, to get these these things across to clients. Okay? Okay, there, there's a reason why there, there's a reason why I asked that question. And that's because we're 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 planning a consumer version of the sequencing risk, the, the part pan cost ravaging paper. And the idea is that we um, have Two page, three two-page document. We team up with some sort of marketing agency in London to design really simple two-page documents. Um, so three three versions: one on sequencing risk, one on withdrawal rates. Ultimately, sign posting clients to financial advisors because what, what I think is that it's hard enough for professionals to deal with these things and to have frameworks and you know in place to manage it yet there are all these DIY clients um, you know thinking that they're going, they're going to DIY their retirement plan and I think that we we should be saying to them look have you thought about this is this really something that you want to do on your own or do you want to speak to a financial planner so that's the idea I've just got to find someone to pay for it <laughs> Okay, and um, so just, I know I'm standing between you and your coffee break, um, just just a few things, o audio and video and the, the handouts will be available online a few, a few days after the conference, so you can go back to this. Um, there's a feedback sheet in your pack, so um, just let you rate each of the speakers and the content. I would definitely like to know what you think. Actually, I need to get the feedback sheet back because if I don't, then you don't get your CPD certificates. <laughs> okay, so, and, um, yeah, I think that's it for now. Um, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be back in 20 minutes. Um, so, coffee, is just right at the the, the foyer. Oh, yes. <laughs> I see you in twenty minutes. Investment or decumulation in investment, making good choices at, at that point in the, in the savings life cycle. Um, we're also going to try and highlight some of the changes that we see happening to the product and and particularly to the advice process that are being implemented kind of as we speak and will continue to be imp implemented over the next year or so to try and address some of those, some of those challenges. The key questions we're going to try and address here um, within this, this sort of half hour session, I guess we've got 25 minutes, half an hour. What do we mean by decumulation and why is it so different to the accumulation problem? Um, what are the key risks that these clients in decumulation must, must face, that they have to manage? <coughs> And then when you think about the advice process and the, the I guess, the much used term of, of, of assessing suitability, and um, what does risk profile really mean for a, for a customer at the point of retirement and seeking to accumulate their assets to, to fund retirement income? And how might we link an advice or a recommendations to a client's <coughs> needs in retirement? Uh, and specifically, we'll look at this issue of, I guess, investment against longevity protection. Um, uh, and focus on the potential use of both of these as a necessary aid to managing risk in the decumulation phase of the, of the savings life cycle. Okay, so, so those are the sorts of questions we're going to try and, try and address here.
the first five minutes or so of this is going to look a little bit like some of the stuff that Michael talked about, but a slightly different spin on it maybe. I guess the key difference is here, some of what we'll be talking about, the fact that I'm talking about annuities is definitely putting a, a UK uh, spin on it, there's no doubt about that. Um, we will talk more about the actual implementation of some of these ideas within the advice process and how you might scale that up within, within an advice model. Um, so there's some, some distinctions as we, go, as we go through this, but some of this might look a little bit similar. So I hope everyone can see this. I walked to the back of the room and it seemed to be just about okay. Um, so let's think about the difference between accumulation and decumulation. In the accumulation phase, the saver is essentially trying to grow their assets in real terms, ideally difficult at the moment, over periods of maybe 10 to 20 years or more. And that's to allow them to either spend more today because they, they, they're not going to save so much, or increase their income in future in retirement, or possibly retire earlier. Those are the kind of three fundamental objectives you have when you're when you're when you're investing. And how do you how do you manage risk, or how do you measure risk in any investment during the accumulation phase? Well, pretty typically, so it's more about returns over the long term. But the way risk is measured is typically through an attitude to risk questionnaire, possibly some measure of capacity for loss, and that is in some way used as a proxy for an investor's sensitivity to portfolio volatility. So portfolio return volatility is the primary measure of risk used during the accumulation part of the, of the, of the savings life cycle. And this has been the, the kind of approach used by the vast bulk of the UK investment industry over the last 20 or 30 years, including very much the adv advice sector. Okay, that's, that's, that's the basis for investment recommendation, investment process and advice in the accumulation phase. It might look dressed up, but that's what it's all about. Right? The accumulation is fundamentally different. And what, what we're talking about when we're, when we're talking about decumulation is we mean somebody that is going to use both the yield but also the capital <coughs> within their portfolio to generate a series of sy systematic or, or fixed income payments or withdrawals over their retirement phase. Uh, and what might they want to do through that retirement phase? Well, they might want to maximise the level of income that they can draw down. Uh, they might want to maximise capital or maximise their access to capital during that retirement phase, or they might want to leave more over to their dependents when they die. So both, both of those would be capital objectives as well as some sort of sustainable income objective. We're not really here talking about a very small proportion of clients that can, for example, live off the yield on their portfolio. We're talking about customers, the, the, the vast bulk of retirement customers who are going to have to use the capital in their retirement savings in order to sustain a reasonable lifestyle or a reasonable level of income during retirement. And if we think about how we might think about risk in relation to those objectives, well, this is really all about what's the chance I am going to be able to sustain or meet my spending needs for the rest of my life. I say I need to spend, you know, 20,000 pounds a year for the rest of my life, what's the chance I'm going to be able to do that? And we call that, refer to that as the sort of sustainability of the retirement income. And um, we might worry about the risk of running out of money before we die, or running out of money not being able to sustain those retirement needs, or having to significantly reduce the income level so that it can re remain sustainable. And those were the sorts of risks that Michael referred to 20 minutes or so ago. But the fundamental difference between accumulation and decumulation is, is decumulation is all about sustaining cash flows. It's not necessarily about generating returns or portfolio returns. It's about sustaining some sort of desired cash flow profile. And to kind of illustrate that, and this is the two slides that are going to look a little bit like a couple of slides that Mike, Michael uh, used earlier, um, we're really thinking about this, this issue of, of sequence of returns. So, um, we've got the big blue, the solid blue line going from the bottom left up to the top right. That's a fixed, co compounded 4.7% return. This is kind of what accumulation looks like to some extent. You put in one pound a day, and if you get a fixed compounded return of 4.7% over 30 years, you're going to end up with about four quid for every pound that you started with. Okay, and that's brilliant. That's great. Of course, what we've got here in this line is the decumulation version of that. So that's exactly the same, this is exactly the same set of underlying portfolio returns, but in this case we're starting with £100,000 and we're drawing out £6,000 every year regardless of what happens. And in this case you can see that the decumulation of out of the capital comes right down and bang, precisely at age 90 you run out of money. That's great, so that's telling us that if I get a 4.7% return 
between age 60 and age 90, and I draw down £6,000 from my £100,000 starting fund, that things will work out perfectly, and I'll run out of money at exactly that point. Of course, we know, and you guys know even better now than you did an hour ago, that that's not the way the world works. You don't get, these days, 4.7% fixed returns, uh, well, not, not, not legally anyway. And um, this, is more what the world, this is more what the world looks like. We inject some volatility into that, maybe 10, 10 to 15% volatility into that. We get the red line. So in accumulation, you would basically be indifferent between these two outcomes. You're getting, you're getting exactly the same four pounds for every one pound you put in. In accumulation, these two lines would look broadly in terms of the outcome identical. Um, I guess now you know what happens in the accumulation. This stuff down here isn't looking so good. And in the red outcome, uh, you actually run out of money about seven or eight years earlier than you would have done. Oh, mute. Oh. Loud. We shouldn't mess with it. That's the last letter. Is it is better? Right. Mm -hmm. Sorry, sorry. You want me to bring it up? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. It's working. Yeah. Okay. Sorry now. You can hear me even more. <laughs> I'll shout a little less. Right? Okay, so you're running out of money about seven or eight years earlier. And I guess the, the, the kind of critical point here is that any product or advice process, advice model that we use to support recommendations for clients at this point of the process, or indeed at any point through this decumulation process, needs to capture this sequence of returns risk, either the product, and Michael's talked about some, 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 some aspects of that, but also our advice process. And just one, one obvious example, if we use, as, as many advisors would do, some kind of deterministic or fixed rate illustration, as opposed to a stochastic or Monte Carlo projection, you're going to ignore this. You're going to assume, four, deterministic illustration will tell you that a 4.7% return will keep you okay until you're age 90. Well, that picture is just <coughs> that is not the case. I can show you lots of 4.7% return scenarios where, where you will run out of money well before age 90. So if your client had told you, yeah, I need to generate six grand a year, and I need to generate that until I'm age 90, or at least very close to it, you use a deterministic illustration to do that calculation, it will tell you, you're good, you're fine. Well, you're not. There's a significant risk that you will run out of money early, and that's, that's due to the, 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 the issue of sequence of returns. Okay? Um, so we need to think about how our advice model and our, the products we're using, the investment solutions we're using, can manage this risk. Uh, if we think beyond that sequence of returns issue, so I'm starting to hopefully migrate away from some of the repetitive, uh, repeating stuff Michael said half an hour ago, we can think about some other issues. So we've talked a little bit about market risk or sequence of returns risk. So there are other risks that a customer will face in decumulation. Maybe most obvious one, longevity risk. So the risk that they simply live longer than are expected. So they get the, the very nice 4.7% return, so that the assets do okay, but they just end up living until they're 95 and they run out of money. So that's, that's longevity risk. Mortality risk is the kind of flip side of that, maybe why you wouldn't buy an annuity, you buy an annuity, you give all your money to, to Tim or, or somebody and you, you die tomorrow. You know, that, that's, that's, the, that's the flip side. That's dying early, having committed all your money to some kind of longevity protected product. And then maybe the one that certainly Michael referred to is probably less, it's, it's, it's almost the skeleton in the closet in the UK market, is the, is the inflation risk, which is um, I, I, I just, my, 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 my income is unable to keep up with inflation over a retirement phase of maybe 20 to 30 years or more, where the value of one pound is probably going to half, or potentially, depending on what inflation does in the next 20 to 30 years. But, you know, it's a significant risk, this. Okay, so those are all different, dis quite distinct risks that an that investor is going to face when they go through this decumulation journey. And of course the problem for the customer and for the advisor is that the risk management solutions that you would use to manage these different risks are all basically different. So if you think about market risk yet, yeah, you could just stick all your money in, in T-bills or bonds, possibly in very low volatility assets. You could manage the market risk or the sequence of return risk issue but then you might be more exposed to longevity risk if you put everything into bonds that are yielding 3 or 4% and you try and draw down 5%, well, clearly you're going to run out of money with absolute certainty probably by the time you're about 75, 80 or whenever. So you're very exposed to longevity risk. So you've got this 
there's probably this significant conflict between these two. Of course, in the UK, you would traditionally manage that by, by buying an annuity. And I would imagine that a significant number of, of customers will continue to rely on annuities to hedge that, hedge that risk. And again, we can look at these other things. Different types of products, different types of investment solutions are required to manage these different, these, these different risk factors. Um, I guess, yeah, the, the, the potential kind of consequence of that is probably fairly, fairly obvious in terms of how you might need to use blends or, or allocations to different types of risk management solutions in order to hedge a client's risk in retirement. Okay, so if we think about, first of all, just before we go into the advice point, how products and product, product, pro, the product propositions are changing, we're seeing new investment solutions designed to hedge some of these risks or certainly to manage the notion of sequence of returns risk, so targeting sustainable withdrawal levels rather than necessarily volatilities. Um, things like absolute return <coughs> risk or volatility managed funds will probably become pretty topical, I would imagine, in this kind of, in this kind of environment. Obviously, firms developing guarantees, possibly the reinvigoration of the variable annuity type solution, hybrid solutions, uh, uh, and, and it's very similar related to that, products which blend both income generating assets or cash flow matching assets, growth assets, but also some longevity protection. You may see products that can combine those different, those different elements. As has been talked about, there's the notion of dynamic withdrawal. If you want to maximize essentially the, the value, the economic value of somebody's retirement account over the retirement time horizon, you or the retirement customer will need to be willing to manage the withdrawal level dynamically. Just sitting it fixed and, and leaving it is not the optimal way to run somebody's retirement account. And that's clearly where advisors are going to become critically, critically important. Um, we're also going to see um, solutions, I guess, reflecting sorts of behavioural preferences. So um, certainly the idea of perhaps dynamic asset allocation where you try and avoid selling equities just after the market has crashed, for example. Those, those, those sorts of solutions, we may see those start, start to be um, developed in, into the market at a more mass market level. I think, aside all of this, and don't think all of this is going to be dumped into the market at the start of April, because it is absolutely not. Certainly, I think maybe quite a bit of this sort of stuff at the top where the the default retirement investment options will be changed a bit to try and reflect sustainable withdrawal requirements. Um, and this thing down at the bottom, where I think basically, particularly product <coughs> providers who have got a large group of clients who are policyholders who may have very limited access to advice, are very worried about, well, what does balance really mean for somebody at retirement or for somebody in retirement? Can we, can we communicate the actual level of risk in a, in a retirement investment strategy to somebody who's drawing down £6,000 a year. How do we do that? So there's a, there's a significant kind of risk communication and governance challenge that, that, that is being addressed at the moment by most of the providers who are worried about how investors or customers are going to understand the risk in an investment in, the, in retirement. Okay, so we move from the product to think about the advice process and I guess how the advice process is being reconfigured or redesigned in order to address some of these challenges. And if we think about where we are today, really the two, two fundamental elements of the advice process in the UK that's used by the, the large majority of advisors, some kind of attitude to risk or risk profiling process where a client's risk profile is mapped onto funds which are typically risk graded according to some kind of measure of volatility, typically historic volatility in, in many cases. So you're balanced. That means you get you, you want to target volatility of 8 to 10 or 8 to 12 or whatever. Again, it's maybe not always presented in that way, but that's often what's underlying the process, okay? Um, a quick example as to why volatility is not a useful or a good measure of risk for retirement or for customers in decumulation. So here we've got three risk-graded investment options. I hope everyone can see these can just cash cautious and balanced with a 30% and a 60% equity allocation in, in these two. We've got a volatility number, I'm not even sure how I calculated that, but whether it's historic or, or, or estimated, but you've got a volatility of 0, 6 and 10. And, and then we've got some notional risk grade, 1, 3 and 5, it could just be low, medium, high or conserv cash, conservative balance, whatever, whatever you want to call it, but, but three risk grades there. And we've also got a kind of worst loss, one year loss number, so that's a sort of one year in every 20, you would expect a loss at least as big as that. 
And that's all, those numbers are all just essentially based on volatility in one form or another. What we did was we said, well, okay, what happened if somebody retired in 2008, started drawing down a level of income that was more or less equivalent to the annuity they could have bought in 2008, and then five years later reviewed where their fund was and said, right, how much annuity could I buy now with my remaining fund? Okay, so that's what, that was the calculation we did. And you can look at the outcome for those three different risk-grade investment options. Uh, if you just put all your money in cash, drawn down an annuity level of income for that five-year period, and then at the end of the five-year period said, how much money have I got left? How much annuity could I buy now? Your annuity income would have fallen by 25%. Whereas in these two risk-graded options down here, which in the face of it are higher risk, the impact in terms of your ongoing sustainable level of retirement income was much less. The hit on your retirement income was much lower. And that was all because largely that big hit on retirement income was about falling interest rates. It wasn't about equity market returns. So much equity markets were broadly speaking flat over that five year over that five year period. It was the fact that you, you had big, big falls in interest rates. You did also, as Michael had would have said earlier, you had a, a big hit on your equity fund right in the first year or two of that five year period, which certainly certainly didn't help. Um, you were hit by two things there. Um, so this is just to highlight that relying on a risk profile which is then mapped to some kind of measure of volatility is not going to do a good job of aligning a client with a risk graded investment option for retirement. It might work fine for accumulation but around retirement it's going to lead you into, into pretty weird places. Another, another solution which you touched on earlier was just cash flow projection and the, and the use of fixed rate cash flow projections which of course ignores this, this notion of sequence of returns. So what if, if none of those work, what do we do? Well, as Michael said, standard practice in the US is to use some kind of Monte Carlo simulation to project outcomes and to calculate some metrics that summarize the risk in a particular retirement strategy. So, and this is probably the pretty standard measure, which is what is the chance that I can sustain all of my retirement spending needs given my retirement plan, given the way I've invested my retirement funds, okay? So it's a percentage number, essentially, somewhere between you have no chance at all and you are absolutely guaranteed to achieve all your retirement needs. And of course, that's going to be a function of, of two things. One, it's going to be a function of what your retirement cash flows are, how much do you want to spend, and it's going to be a function of how you have invested your assets in order to generate those, those retirement cash flows. And okay, a number between 0% and 100% is maybe a bit nebulous, so most providers come up with some kind of guide as to what a good answer is. And this kind of 75% to 95% range here, which we call the comfort zone, is a fairly, fairly representative kind of level. And if you, as long as you can keep the, keep the sustainability, the, this, this percentage number in this zone here, you're probably okay. If you're below 75%, then there's probably too much risk that you're going to run out of money or you're going to have to significantly reduce your income. And if you're up here, over 90% or maybe over 95%, and then, well, you're either probably possibly not spending enough or you could be significantly de-risking and still achieving all your, all your retirement needs. So, so there's this kind of notion of some, sort of, of some sort of comfort zone or confidence zone. And most of the retirement planning technology tools that you see in the US have this sort of notion of, um, associated with them. Um, of course, you can combine that with other metrics like the, the age at which you might expect to run out of money, and maybe most importantly, your projected fund level to, to help an advisor and a customer, first of all, understand risk in retirement, but also help them understand and manage the trade-off between security of income and access to capital or, or capital growth. And that's the, the kind of key trade-off that, that we have in, in retirement. Um, the other reason to use this is it certainly helps an advisor and a customer identify the maximum withdrawal rate. At any point in retirement, you can kind of use this to say, effectively ask the question, how much, what's the maximum withdrawal I can take um, at a sensible level of confidence? It also supports a like, what-if question. So what if I reduce my income level? How much does this probability go up? What if I invest my assets a bit differently? I, I, I invest in, in a lower risk portfolio or in a, in a higher risk fund. What does that do to where I sit on this scale? And perhaps in the UK market, this is where I'll, I'll, I'll try and finish on. What if I take some of my assets and perhaps put them into some kind of longevity protected product like an annuity or a secure income product like an annuity? 
can that help me get into the right place in terms of sustainability? So if we think about this question of annuities and, and investment or annuities and drawdown, um, most accumulation clients to some extent or varying extents have the following objectives, both to maximise some secure or sustainable income level, probably for the rest of their life, um, but also to, to maximise their wealth or, or the residual wealth of access to capital, either for themselves or, or to leave as a bequest. Um, so I've got a simple example here where uh, male, age 60, this is where a few numbers, I'm afraid, um, we're nearly at lunch, um, male age 60 uh, would, could, could buy a fixed lifetime annuity, and I, and I took these numbers of hard years about three or four months ago, um, of £5,200. Okay, so we'll look at the, the drawdown example of that where rather than buying the annuity, I just draw down a fixed income of £5,200 from my, my account and it's going to be invested in a, in a balanced fund charging 1%, I think, was, was how it did this. Okay, so if you do that, first of all, this is looking at the, the risk of running out of money in drawdown. So this is a pretty simple chart, hopefully, just says the probability of having run out of money gets bigger as you get older. So as you pro progress from like age 75 through to age 90, this, the, the risk that you have run out of money is going to increase up to just over 25%. So by age 90, there is, there's actually slightly more than a 25% chance that you have run out of money in this particular investment strategy. Again, this, this, this red line is sort of roughly at life expectancy. So you can see there's a sort of 15 to 20% chance that you'll have run out of money before you die or before you might expect to die. And so there's quite a lot of risk of ruin or risk of running out of money your main. This is clearly one of the main risks in, in drawdown. Um, we can look at kind of, I guess, the benefit of, of drawdown, which is this chart here. And I'm not going to go through all the details of the, what this is, other than this is the projection the stochastic projection of the residual fund, the, the amount of capital that you've got left over through the, the retirement phase. So you can see that this is the, the kind of average outcome here, and actually in the median you're more or less staying with your, you're more or less retaining your £100,000 initial capital, but you can see there are plenty of scenarios down here where you're, you're more or less running out of money by age, but certainly by age, by age 90. Um, so, so that's that. that that's, <coughs> this, 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 this growth, this sort of retained access to capital, is clearly the main benefit of, of investing rather than putting all your money into the annuity. So we can we can think about how we summarise all that information into something that's a little bit more digestible, um, in, in, in order to allow us to compare the suitability of these different options in relation to a client's specific retirement needs. So here we've just got the simple annuity versus drawdown. We've got the sustainability number, so for annuity, we can sustain that target income with a probability of 100%. Um, with the drawdown policy or drawdown investment, we've got a 57% chance of achieving all of our retirement income needs. In this case, the, the target income was £5,200, the same as the annuity. I guess this highlights the kind of absolute polarised outcome or po polarised um, nature of these two solutions. You know, with the annuity, you're going to have no fund left over but you've got a guaranteed income equal to your target. With the, with the drawdown investment, you've got a pretty significant chance you're not going to achieve all your, all your income needs, but there's a pretty significant residual fund value. This is calculated at age 85. So this is saying at age 85, you'd expect to have 68,000 pounds left over of your starting 100 grand, and you would expect, on average, the money to run out at age 86. So this is, this is kind of highlighting the kind of contrasting nature of these two solutions and the fact that really for this client, neither of these two things really do what this guy needs, okay? So let, let's, let's look at some obvious combinations of these two. So in this case, we're looking at the annuity and the drawdown again, but in the middle, we've just got three simple blends of these two things. So we've taken 25% drawdown, 50% drawdown, and 75% drawdown. And we've calculated the same metrics, and I guess this is showing you that well, let's look at this, this, this blend here where we've got half annuity, half drawdown. There is a 75% chance we're going to achieve all of our retirement income needs for life. And the remaining fund, the expected remaining fund at age 85 is 39 grand. And you expect to run out of money at age 91. You've also got some guaranteed income, which is, of course, coming from the, from the annuity. So on the face of it, so long as we can keep this probability and this kind of income comfort zone that we've described here, this, and so long as this guy's willing to take a little bit of risk, this solution looks like it's this blend, this blend of annuity and drawdown looks like it's likely to be better aligned with this, 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 this individual's objectives than putting it all into an annuity or all into drawdown. 
And we've developed tools that allow advisors to go through this process like this and ask a series of what if questions like, okay, in this case we're comparing an existing investment portfolio with three risk graded options and this, this sort of tool allows the advisor and the customer to say well what if I'm worried about living longer, so what if I'm worried about not living to 85 but living out to 95, okay well obviously if you, if you, if you want to plan out to age 90 or 95 then the probabilities that you're going to be able to sustain your income out that much longer horizon are going to, are going to reduce so what might you do about that? How might you manage that longevity risk? Well, of course, you could manage that longevity risk perhaps by allocating some of your retirement savings to a secure income product like an annuity. And we can do that, and you can see as you, as you increase that annuity allocation, in this case, the, the sustainability ratings start to go back up to a, to a sort of safe level. So you can understand this trade-off between the security of the income and the term of the income and the access, the ongoing access to capital. And those are the, don't worry so much about exactly how it's presented, it's the underlying numbers that, that really are, are the important thing here. It's this notion of how, how sustainable is my income and what's the trade-off between that and how much money I'm going to continue to be able to access or I'm going to be able to leave to my dependents when I die. I'll do this. Again, you can present that in cash flow terms. So again, we just have an average outcome there and you can move and look at our poor outcome. So in the poor outcome here, you're actually running out of money at age, age 85, I think it is, and you can see the annuity and the guaranteed income from the annuity biting at that, at that point. So you can understand, okay, sustainability is 75%. What does that really mean in terms of what if things really do go wrong? Well, this is the sort of picture as to what would happen if things really did go wrong. All right? And I guess you could take the information from that type of analysis and embed it into a suitability report. So you're telling the client, What's the chance that you can sustain all that target income for, for the rest of your life? How much, how much fun do they expect to have left over? Those sorts of metrics can then be embedded into a suitability report to demonstrate that you've explained to the client what the risks are and you've demonstrably aligned that, in that, that selection with the client's financial needs or with their retirement needs. Okay. So this is just, just, sorry, just one example. You can understand there's, there's a bunch of numbers under this. The main numbers being what's the chance I can achieve my retirement needs and how much fund do I have access to and of course how you embed that into your advice process is going to vary from, from one business to the next. But it's not, you don't, you don't need to overcomplicate it I guess. And the final slide here that I've got was thinking about the importance of review and this is probably something that UK advisors in the main have not had to worry about so much but it's going to become absolutely critical post April this year because anyone invested in retirement is going to be very, very dependent on some kind of review of their retirement plan. Whether that's done face-to-face -face with an advisor, whether it's done automatically on a platform, probably doesn't matter so much, but this is going to have to happen at one, one level or another, right? And this is kind of trying to show or quantify the value of that. And there's lots of different ways of doing this, but this is just one example. So here, what I'm going to do is look at two cases. One where I just draw down, I think, I can't remember how much it is yet, Okay, so I've got a fund of 300 grand, and it's starting a fund of 300,000 pounds, I think, and I'm going to draw down 15,000 pounds per annum from that, uh, so 5% of the initial fund. And I'm going, to, I'm going to look at two cases, one where I don't review it at all, and I just keep drawing down 15,000 pounds a year until the car crashes, and one where I review that withdrawal rate every year to keep myself in that income comfort zone as I described it, to essentially keep the probability or the sustainability number at least at 75%, right? So that will mean that over time you will have to vary that income, uh, meaning you have some reduction in income at times, um, but of course it will mean that the, 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 the retirement plan remains sustainable. And we can kind of look at the two outcomes from this. So the first of these is where there's no review and you're just going to draw down a fixed income of 15 grand basically until, until you either die or you run out of money. So the chances of running out of money by age 90 in that case is 1 in 5, 20%. The projected median income at age 90 is still 15,000, so you're, you're still expecting, on average, you'd still be generating that 15 grand at age 90. But there's a 10% chance you run out of money by age 84. Uh, the expected residual fund at age 80 is, is, is 54,000 pounds. And we're able to calculate kind of internal rate of return on this retirement plan and so what we said in the, in the worst cases, in the lower 10% of our scenarios, this plan is going to return 
1.5% per annum. So that's the kind of worst case, right? Things really don't go badly. You get hit by a nasty sequence of returns or whatever it might be. This plan will run return 1.5%. If we now look at the case where you're re we're reviewing this every year, um, and this could be done on a pretty much automated basis if you wanted it to, um, the chance of running out of money, of course, is zero. You're reviewing the income level every year. The projected median or expected income level at age 90 is now 14,000 rather than 15,000. So there, there is a reasonable chance you're going to have to reduce the income, but only by a, by a little bit. So that, that's probably tolerable for a lot of people. Um, there's now, of course, no chance the funds are going to run out of money. Um, the now the expected residual fund is significantly higher, and the internal rate of return, the, the return on this plan, in those scenarios where you most need the advice, is now quite significantly higher. You're about 1% 1, 1 higher. So the kind of value of this advice or this review process for this customer, particularly when the outcomes are not so good, where they most need the advice, they most need the review, is about 1%. Yeah, that's, that's, the kind of, that's the kind of measure of the value of the advice process or the value of the review process here. So you can imagine that for some clients with large funds, that, that might be you know, well in the bounds of face-to-face -face advice. For other clients with smaller pots, you could, you could see this being automated on some kind of platform where that, that sort of value becomes economically, economically viable. Okay, but significant value in the advice process. Now, if you think what asset managers might be charging for active management, etc., 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 this is a pre pretty, this is pretty material. Okay, you're going to, as a retirement customer, you're going to get a lot more out of this that I, I would contest than you would out of a lot of investment solutions or or, or certain types of investment vehicles. So this this is a this is an advice point, and it's it's really really valuable to the customer. Okay, um, final slide takeaways. Yeah, I mean I guess what we're seeing, we're working with a bunch of product providers to develop the sorts of products we described earlier and you'll see those I guess evolving into the market over the next 6 to 12 to 18 months I guess. Um, I think over again over a similar period of time and this is not all going to happen by April we're definitely seeing advice businesses implementing this kind of new framework for advice one form or another particularly the big let's say the big banks for, for those sorts of guys those, those, those sorts of organizations are absolutely implementing the sort of process I've just, I've just described and they'll do it, and then of course the advice community, I guess, will either do it or, or decide that it's a lot, a lot of rubbish. Um, uh, and, and, and critical to that is clearly going to be the technology. So being able to scale this up, this, this all looks very complicated. It needs to be able to be completely scalable. And the whole point of using those numbers is actually to make the advice process scalable. Once you start to kind of quantify it, you can, you can build this into a platform, you can make this D to C, of course, for a lot of customers, they're not going to want D2C, they're going to want advisors. Advisors can offer a D2C platform themselves. So there's a lot of ways to use these numbers to make the whole advice model much, much more scalable, particularly when it comes to reviewing a client's retirement plan on an ongoing basis than it has traditionally been and it would be at the moment. So that scalability is clearly going to be pretty, pretty critical here. All right, um, that's me done. Thanks very much, guys. Um, and I'll hand back to Abraham. Um, I, I think that I was reading I was reading an article on an advice lounge recently, and someone the, the, the author of the article was saying that the battle for 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 us isn't really um, the, the battle between uh, the competition isn't really between advisors. The competition is, as far as I'm concerned, between advice and non-advice. You know, I, and I can't stress enough, you know, why it's important that we find ways to make clients appreciate the complexities around this, why advice is valuable, and the important and crucial work that we're doing to get them, um, to, to make their retirement as sustainable as possible. Um, I can rant on and on about this, and I'm sure you all have questions for Michael and, and Phil and Tim about, you know, about today's presentation, but we'll go out right now and, and have a look at the tools, um, play around with them, ask as many questions as, as we can, and then we'll go off to lunch at quarter past one, 
and then we'll come back here at around about 10 past 1, sorry, 10 past 2 for the Q&A session. Sounds like a plan? Uh, anybody got a question? Yeah, Duncan? Yeah. Phil, I, I just think, well, all, of, all, all four of you, but Phil, just what's your view on defined benefit to defined contribution? How do you think that might open up? Uh, uh, <laughs> just a general one. Just a general question. Um, oh, we need to record. You need to speak into this. We're recording. Speak into this, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so we can see you later on. Yeah, thanks. Um, this is recording for posterity. Clearly, there'll be a lot of people with very valuable defined benefit pensions that are index linked or roughly speaking inflation linked that are going to make it quite, a, I guess, a, an income profile in retirement over 20 or 30 or 40 years, which is probably not well aligned with their financial needs. And if, if I was one of those people, I'd certainly be uh, pretty keen to try and uh, uh, access the cash as quickly as I could. So it's clearly going to create a, 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 an immediate advice challenge, and I think from what we can see in the UK market at the moment, there is a there is a lot of concern, stroke reticence on the part of the industry to to deal with that problem. For for you know, listen, completely understandable reasons. It's a major major risk, and if you get that those sorts of calls wrong, it's going to be a going to be significant you know significant fallout. So. I, th I think I think there's an obvious demand there. Whether the market is in a position to really deal with it is is probably another question. From from my end, I'd add Bruce really fast. I mean, having I don't think uh, I can't get away from it. <laughs> I didn't too. Um, so I, I I find the I find this this space here really fascinating. Uh, again, uh, as I said earlier, as a juxtaposition to the U.S. So. We've been in what's basically a slow motion 30 year transition away from defined benefit and towards uh, defined contribution. Uh, driven, frankly, I think, kind of dually, well, so really three reasons. One, um, just large companies finding that once you accumulate like 50 years worth of employees and the liability associated with them, the one year volatility on your earnings to fully fund that with you know 50 years worth of. Uh, Participant drag gets really, really problematic. So it just it's it's got a scaling problem to it. Eventually, the pension plan outscales the rest of the business, and uh, uh, and the whole business cash flow becomes subject to it. So that's been the the first major driver away. I, I think the second, frankly, is the point that we were doing that coincided with the beginning of the the late 1970s, the beginning of the 1980s. So our first 20 year trek down the road of having more defined contribution plans was done in the midst of a giant generational cohort that we call our baby boomers uh, and was done in the midst of a raging bull market in stocks and bonds simultaneously that so enamored them with the opportunities of controlling your investments uh, that we're, we're still kind of hinged to that and ain't going to go back. Uh, and, and frankly, there's a third piece that you know maybe is a little bit of a cultural difference. I don't, I don't know quite how much, but I mean, I mentioned at the beginning, like, in, in the U.S., we just we have such a mentality around uh, autonomy of choice and freedom and, and, and control. That, I mean, there's just this mentality like, I don't care if I'm going to completely screw it up. I'll be damned if you're going to take my money and not let me screw up my own retirement. Uh, and like we say it proudly. So, uh, so like there's such a mentality, and, that, and that's why you see like, uh, you know, like I, I thought Tim's statistics were fascinating around you know the uh, adoption of, of annuities here in the U.K. Uh, and what they see is the, as the shift when liquidity is available. I have to confess, I don't, I don't know exactly what the numbers are for the percentage of people who keep pensions when we have lump sum options, which we do in the U.S., except that it's a pretty low percentage. When you look at the number of people who have portfolios, though, and decide whether to purchase immediate lifetime annuities, literally it's a 2% annuitization rate or less in the U.S. Again, just like once we control our big money, I'll be damned if we're going to let it go. Uh, but but the interesting piece to that from the, from the advice realm, the advisory world, like the fact that that occurs, that has fueled the growth of financial planning, investment advice, portfolio management, asset center management firms in a massive secular trend in, in the U.S. So 
Uh, you know, I follow our industry benchmarking studies a lot and write a lot about the business of financial planning as well. So you wind back 10 or 15 years in the U.S. The average U.S. advisor uh, had um, $20 million of assets under management and you know, a secretary. You go back about five years ago, and the average advisory firm had about, or six or seven years ago, it's like right before GFC, the average advisory firm had two advisors, four or five staff, and $100 million of funds under management. You look at it now, and notwithstanding kind of the, the you know, U-turn of the markets over the past six years, uh, now the average firm is $200 million under management, two or three partners, and seven or eight advisory staff. It's like we are literally building large and growing independent advisory firms that we never had in the U.S. before. Uh, seven or eight years ago, the hot thing was firms trying to push towards a billion dollars under management. Now lots of firms are at a billion. We're at 1.4. We're not even, you know, we're at 1.4 billion under, under management. We're barely a top 10 advisor in our city. Uh, Five billion is now the new hot number. We see a lot of firms that are getting $10 billion under management. And that's completely transforming the landscape for advisors. So we have a huge range of tools, technology, platforms that are available to us because all of these independent advisory firms that are building on their own that need solutions around them. So like I was talking to uh, someone at lunch about things like platform. Our platform, our platform is free. We pay nothing in a platform fee because the platforms are so ludicrously large now that they take a very, very small slice of revenue shares off of some of the products we use. They make a tiny slice off of the money market funds, which is only a tiny percentage even of our clients' funds under management. But when Schwab has $1.2 trillion, if we keep 5% in cash and they make a couple basis points off of that, they're literally making hundreds of millions of dollars off of like a tiny, tiny, tiny slice uh, of our assets. So they build these extraordinary uh, platforms because of what gets fueled off of the independent movement. And to me, the independent movement got fueled off of what happens when advisors start building assets under management businesses that have recurring revenue. And just the nature of how a business begins to grow and scale as an advisor when you have recurring revenue that doesn't exist when you're transactional is ultimately massively transformative to the marketplace. And so I'm incredibly curious to see how it plays out for all of you here because we've been doing this as like a slow 30-year trend really rising over the past 15 years on a purely voluntary basis. You're doing it by regulatory fiat and you have 18 months. So like, off we go. I, I think, uh, thank you, Michael, for that. And I think the interesting thing, and we were having this conversation with, with a firm I, I work with, um, a, a client, interestingly, worked for the FSA. So this is FSA DB schemes that we were thinking of transferring. Um, but I, I, <laughs> that we were, yes, that we were thinking of transferring into a DC. But I just get the impression that well. <laughs> I just get the impression that um, advisors, I use that generically, but I just get the impression that we're just too scared to to do this um, because you know we're worried about a how do we how do we demonstrate from a suitability point of view that this is right advice, b that some sort of miscellaneous scandals going to um, Ray, it's ugly head up in the future, um, and, and we just don't want to be part of it. Which brings me to, to my next question for, 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 for these guys is, is, oh sorry, did you have something to say? Did you? There are people who want to be part of it. <coughs> sorry, there are people who want to be part of it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, who don't need a pension. Good yeah. sales speech. Thank you very much. Yeah, like from from the from the U.S. end, like I'm just like the transition from pensions to people being able to roll out pensions and manage them, like just from the business <laughs> perspective. You are literally talking uh, once in a lifetime business opportunity. I, I mean, truly, you are all facing a once in a lifetime business opportunity for that much money to be coming in motion all at once at a time that people desperately need advice to know what to do with it and they have assets and there's money there and they have the wherewithal to pay you and there are mechanisms by which you can be paid uh, like truly that is once in a lifetime kind of business opportunity uh, in the industry and when you look around the globe 
the moments at which countries allow people to begin to uh, self-manage their own pensions is massively transformative around the uh, investment and retirement business in every country around the world. It's fueled the growth in the U.S. You look at Australia, Australia's growth in financial planning, investment management exploded exactly when they got the liquidity to their plans. Like it's, it's an unbelievable business opportunity. Notwithstanding all the very valid risks that Abraham points out, it's like, if you're going to do this, you better know what the hell you're talking about uh, when, you're, when you're talking to people. Uh, but it, uh, like truly once in a generation lifetime opportunity you're looking at in front of you right now. So which brings me to, to, to my question then. Is Monte Carlo, or stochastic modeling, is it the holy grail here in demonstrating suitability? Um, is it really? Because ultimately what you're doing is choosing random numbers um, for, for, for your returns. So is it really the, the holy grail in, in demonstrating suitability, or is it just no better than the deterministic model? I'll, I'll let him start. <laughs> So you know what I'm saying. Yeah, Marcus can take over after this. Um, I thought Marcus' presentation was fantastic, certainly insightful, but fortunately I'm uh, sort of coming off a lot of the things that he mentioned, which is a, a, a good start. Um, so what was the question, Abraham? Tell me this in Monte Carlo. Is yes. the Holy Grail? Most advisors are struggling with this. I mean, the system I use has got a Monte Carlo simulation on it. It is just one of the things we look at when we're looking at all the other things we look at for clients. Uh, I'm incredibly cautious of a lot of my uh, assumptions, which I believe a lot of other people in the room are. So my clients die at 100 <coughs> in the uh, forecast that I create, and the returns above inflation are very, very, very low. I have started to work more and more with Monte Carlo simulations uh, using the system I use, and I've still got probably more questions than answers. Um, but I am working with other advisors in the room about how to take this forward. So I'm keen to see other tools that are available, uh, and certainly things that are in the US as well. And I know I'll say to Michael. So then, Michael, if, if your assumptions are just, you know, ultra cautious, you know, you, you assume 1%. Um, <laughs> I'll take that if you get yeah, Michael to say But if, you, if your assumptions are just ultra cautious, so you take 1%, um, you know, real return and 4% inflation and 100, age 100, you're going to be there. You, you know, we, we don't need all this. Modeling. Yeah, you know, if you don't mind telling your clients to spend 2% of their wealth and then apologize to them when they're 85 years old and have $17 million and are going, you ruined my, you ruined my lifetime, you ruined my retirement, you forced me not to spend and enjoy the money while I can, and now I'm 85 and too sick to enjoy it, and have completely destroyed my goals by not letting me spend the money I could have and die with a giant inheritance that wasn't my goal. Uh, thank you for completely failing my goals, but well done. At least I didn't go bankrupt. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I uh, so I, no. I mean, I'm, I'm not a fan from that perspective. I mean, the, at the most basic level, you know, to me, you can choose two ways to do uh, projections to give retirement advice. Number one is assume that market volatility doesn't exist and do it on a straight line. Number two is assume market volatility exists. I'm going to bank number two is always going to give you a better uh, recommendation for clients that is more robust to the real world than number one. <coughs> so number one is deterministic straight line projections, and number two is Monte Carlo. So at the most basic level, Monte Carlo is just a means to project volatility. And so if your question is like, do I think it's a better regulatory and cautious strategy for clients to assume volatility exists than to assume it doesn't exist? I'm going to bet that modeling volatility will probably give you more relevant uh, recommendations for clients in the long run than not assuming volatility and then contorting recommendations or contorting your assumptions in strange ways to try to replicate the volatility that you know is there, but for some reason you don't want to model. Now, that being said, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of challenges around how you implement effective Monte Carlo engines and analytical tools. So there's... The, you know, the good news is you can handle a lot of volatility and other assumptions and complexity. The bad news is there's a lot of complexity, so there's a lot of assumptions. Models have to be built well. I, you know, we see a wide range in the U.S. You run two different Monte Carlo engines with the same client inputs. You get materially different outcomes 
uh, across the platforms. Some are more disclosing than others about what their assumptions are. Um, our uniform uh, uh, rule in our office, if you can't explain and demonstrate to me every single assumption that came out of the Monte Carlo software, you have no chance of being adopted in our office and I will probably bash you in public. Because um, truly there's no excuse for that. Um, you have to be transparent about your assumptions and your tools, especially with that level of complexity. Granted, not everybody wants to vet them, but at least someone's got to be able to vet it and highlight uh, the problems. And frankly, I have found problems with Monte Carlo software in the US. I found tools that had unrealistic assumptions. I actually found more than one engine that actually had computational errors because um, I could see the outcomes and I could tell that they weren't right. So there, there definitely is challenge around it. Like, I don't want to gloss over the challenges of essentially how difficult it is to do effective due diligence on a Monte Carlo tool because it's so complex it's, it's, it's difficult to vet properly. Um, but that being said, I still don't think it's an improvement to go back and therefore assume volatility doesn't exist and do everything on a straight line. Like, we have to get to Monte Carlo style tools that recognize volatility in the real world. But can we do better about due diligence? Absolutely. And frankly, the second generation of that, which it, to me is even still lacking in the US, we're just on the cusp of it, is figuring out better ways to actually communicate the outcome and the outputs. Because coming it down to like a single line item, okay, your probability of success is okay, blank. Mike, I'm going to stop problem. you because I want to come back to the issue. Have, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to come back to the issue of how we communicate this thing to, to clients and the, relev the, the relevance of it. But I want to pick on the point you made about the assumptions or, yep. or the black box natures of, of this tool. And my, my question is for Phil, I want you to, to comment on that, and I want Iris to say a word about it, and I want one of the guys from Capital to say a word about it. The impression I get, because I looked at, you know, I looked at this tool, is that there's, there's, there's an assumption generally out there, um, I don't want to be specific, but there's an assumption that the, the financial planner shouldn't be the one to, to, to decide the assumptions, investment return and, and correlations between asset performance and, and perhaps advisors don't want to do that, you tell me otherwise. Um, and so someone like um, Moody's come along, make all these assumptions, um, they write a 133 page document to explain it, uh, but I have no idea unless I want to, um, I've, I've, I, you know, and I am. Um, completely, um, was the word, crazy, because I, I read Ned Kassler wrote a paper, 133-page document, and I sat in the evening, sitting <laughs> the weekend, and I read through it, and I woke, <coughs> just, just, you know, woke up and said, Abraham, you're crazy, you know that. Right, so unless someone's prepared to do that, I'll give him credit, it's transparent though. Love it. <laughs> it's all there. Unless someone's prepared to do that, and there are things that they wouldn't understand on it. Um, if I don't understand the assumption, I have you know, I have um, no chance of being able to explain it to the client and even no chance of knowing whether or not is it's you know, it's it's robust. So what do you say to that then? A question there. Well, the, 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 que the question is: Is this really? Is this really a black? Is, is this really a black box? Um, of course, it's not. Uh, a, a one observation: Our <coughs> models, the, 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 the Monte Carlo simulation engines that are used inside, for example, the likes of Capita and Iris, um, are, when those those are used in two places, they're used by insurance company actuaries to measure and manage risk on the balance sheets of their own businesses, and they're used by retail financial advisors to carry out financial planning for uh, retail customers. The, the risk management problem is, <coughs> to, to a large extent, exactly the same. You've got a bunch of assets and you've got a bunch of liabilities. The insurance company's assets are a little bit more complicated, but it's essentially and fundamentally the same, the same thing. When we sell the model to an insurance company, typically the model might undergo anything up to three to six months of due diligence by a team of actuaries and quantitative analysts. And that's, that's, the, that's the effort those organisations will put into to carrying out due diligence on a Monte Carlo simulation. Bear in mind this is modelling interest rates, inflation, risk asset prices across probably 30 or 40 different global economies. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of variables that these Monte Carlo simulation engines can be modelling and that the effort that we go into to carrying out the due diligence on that is, is, is significant. 
So the biggest challenge we have had in, in the, certainly in the UK market and from, from my experience in the US market, I think the problem must be the same, is that the quality of due diligence that's been carried out in a lot of the models is almost zero. Um, there is almost no real understanding in the UK retail market of the difference between the three or four different Monte Carlo simulation models that are available in that market. Uh, and in accumulation, maybe, maybe you get away with that. In decumulation, it's quite possible you will figure out quite quickly what these different models are doing <coughs> because the, 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 the materiality of the differences in the numbers that are coming out of these models and the implications of that in terms of the recommendations that you would be making to a customer about their investment strategy will be really significant. Uh, so I think one thing that the, 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 the market, the financial planning retail advisory market in the UK is going to have to find a way to do is run better due diligence of, of Monte Carlo simulation. Yeah, well you say that, but I haven't got a team of, you know... No, so, so, on so, as so, as so I think one, one, one observation is it is, so it is going to be hard for small individual advisory businesses to buy these models directly um, if they want to run um, strong due diligence of, of, of the product. And I, I think that's, that's, so, yeah. so in essence, if I go off and, and use capital tool, you're saying I take it at face value that capital or some, someone else has done the due diligence? Clearly, clearly between capita and the provider of the model, we have to make available the 133 page document or whatever it is, right? <laughs> and we have to make that available in a range of different formats so that you guys can, can, can get, get it in, in, a, in half an hour's read. You can then go into the different parts of the documentation and figure out, I want to learn more about how this model models interest rates or models UK equities. You can go in and get that information, okay? But the bottom line is, if the model is going to be subject to full and comprehensive due diligence, these guys and us have to make available all that information. Otherwise, you have no way of deciding between these different these different products. Absolutely, it's going to involve you know a lot of engagement between ourselves, between Capita, between Iris, between between their clients and our clients to to, to, to support that. But that that's I'm afraid that is a and as, you know, as Michael said, if you don't know what's going in the on in the model. You really shouldn't be using it. I think it's, it's about the size of it. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, it's, I think Martin wants to say something. Go on. If you grab Martin at all. Well, I'm the guy that's been bugging him. Hey, Brian. Um, <coughs> sounds great. Did you get that? Read the 123 page. Yeah, no, no, that sounds fantastic. So we've, we've got, cause, cause I'm the guy actually who bugged Presswood to get a response back as well. So um, yeah. what I'd like to know is that, that sounds fabulous. Yeah. But we are how many days away from this? And we, you guys are coming up with something that we need to look at. Sorry, th these models have been available for the last 10 years in the retail market. So this, this documentation is around. It's already there. The, bear in mind, the underlying model and the model assumptions that we're talking about, those aren't changing at all. This is exactly the same underlying Monte Carlo simulation engine. The only thing that's changing might be, for example, the user interface or the way some of the numbers are presented. The underlying assumptions about, say, interest rates, UK equities, UK correlations, all that stuff, that those are those are obviously they are reviewed on a regular basis. But the methodology of the of, for the underlying model yeah, yeah, is, exactly, is exactly the same. That's, that's fine. fine. But the assumptions ten ten times by now. Yeah, yeah. So, it, the assumptions will be updated. The assumptions will per, typically be updated quarterly. So, so what is done in two thousand and six probably is not of work. Well, the model, the, model the, the, model, the, the model doesn't. The model doesn't change. The model is continually updated, but the, the enhancements to the underlying model. Well, it's starting to grow a lot. What you said in 2006, for example, that might result that I will yeah, well, because we get the model and we'll come if, if you retired in 2006 when interest rates were six, and they update the model now to say interest rates are two because interest rates are two. That doesn't mean you change the model or invalidate anything you did in the past. That's just updating to reflect where clearly when you projected when you projected from six percent interest rates in two thousand and six, there would have been a, pro, a non-zero probability assigned to a two percent interest rate today. It'd been quite a low probability, but it would have been zero. It's not more than two thousand and six, but zero. No, I mean, the, the nature of modeling uncertainty by definition is that when you update your... My definition is wrong. Yeah, when you update it in the future, you know, you, when you update a range of possible outcomes in the future, only one of those outcomes will have occurred. Mm. That does not make anything you did previously wrong or invalid, but it does mean when you project forward from there as an update, you model where you are today and what's actually happened between the starting point and today. That, that doesn't necessarily invalidate or change the model just because you're reflecting 
the actual path you followed and where you are going forward from here. That's like that's the nature of, of ongoing modeling. Now, if you change the underlying computational engine that you feed the data into, that that's different. Like that's a, at least a concerning uh, level of modeling. Uh, 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 Can I just yes, one sec, Tim? You were going to yeah. So um, I think discussion is interesting because it shows these models are quite complex. Um, <laughs> I completely agree with Phil. I think they're really powerful for. Um, you know, extreme events and insurance companies use them in, in all sorts of scenarios to, to, to great effect. I think the key for me is that the model has to be understood by the person using it and the receiver as well, otherwise they, they have limited value. I personally really value scenarios, so I found um, Michael's history lesson was really fascinating and with the, the kind of safe withdrawal rates and, and how that uh, played into different scenarios and, and different periods of time. Now. I don't know whether Michael's available to go around for to each and every one of your clients, but I'm sure. I'm sure. There's, they, a, there's a prize. <laughs> I'm sure they would. Um, they would learn a lot, and that that kind of analysis can really sink in. Um, I say so I found it fascinating and, and, and very illuminating. Can I just so, so one, one second, Michael? Before you, sure. I want to just get the, the, my my question, which is sort of, you why why not leave a financial planner to make the assumptions? Right? If I have you know capital market assumptions that I want to that you know that are obviously backed by data, why can't I just load that in and, and do the model based on that? Thanks, Abram. Uh, beautifully teed up for us. And I promise you, won't be a sales pitch. But in terms of uh, as a technology company, right, give me the mic. No, no, no. We're, <laughs> but we're, we're the conduit to help you present that to clients. Because I think the presentation the scenario analysis is really interesting because it is uh, looking at multiple models to do that. Um, what do financial planners do? It's it's all about. It's not about the plan. It's about the the ongoing planning. And the assumptions. Uh, Abram, I'll ask you a question. Um, the we enable our users to be deterministic or stochastic. If they want to use correlations, then we've got third party providers. Uh, deterministic? No. <laughs> okay, so we've got stochastic <laughs> models that we can build in, but in actual fact, with, with our systems, the advisor is actually in charge, uh, or their investment committees or third parties, in terms of what data you put in. So, in terms of inflation, in terms of pension price index, RPI, etc., etc., you put that in, you put the growth assumptions in. If you then want to overlay correlations, we would then buy it in from a, a trusted third party like a, a Moody's or a or Morningstar, that kind of thing. Thank you. Do you want to say that? Yeah, yeah, of course. So just to, to back up, I guess we'd say that obviously you use tools of ours or, or ours's or uh, any other parties because there is um, uh, an expertise there. Obviously our expertise is in research, so when we want to do what we've done with, with, with our tool, we went to existing experts in that very, very particular, very complicated field. So we went to a very different at the time, obviously now, now Moody's. Um, there's obviously a number of assumptions of your own you can put in, but you use these tools for a reason. And the, as was just said, the reason they're so good is because they're very, very, very complex. But that makes it hard to understand, they're very, very complex. And there is a, a number of supporting documents that are available for ourselves and, and from Moody's that detail quite high level, so not all 133 pages long. There's a couple of sort of 10, 15 pages long that give um, some key points, as, as Phil mentioned, if you want to know how equity is modelled, this is an explanation. If you want to know how cash is modelled, this is an explanation. If you really, really want to dig in and go below that, which we've always encouraged people to do, then unfortunately that is when you're lumbered with a 133 pager, because that, that is the nature of the beast. It's, it's complex and... It's correlation between the asset that. Yeah, I think what I find is you, you guys, are, I look to you, you don't let me choose my assumptions, you kind of do it for me, and, and if I was choosing it, and to be honest, to a great extent with these tools, you, you as a financial planner would have to, um, you know, read, read up the document, um, there are different, you know, there are different models, what, what are they, ESG, and what was the, the other one? You, you, you would have to decide, ultimately, I think it's subjective, but ultimately you would have to decide whether or not you, you accept the strength and, and, and the weaknesses of, of that model. And if you do, and you agree that you accept that someone else is making the, the assumptions, um, then that's fine. If you want a situation where you want to be able to make some of the assumptions, then you've got to find a tool that does that. Hey, Brian, can I just make one point, which might be relevant? I get the feeling here that within the and, and, and elsewhere that within the advisory community, there's a 
there's a, there's a perception that almost the advisors need to be inputting their own capital market assumptions in order in some way to be demonstrating value or I'd contrast that. Well, not necessarily. You know, the, well, certainly they need to understand it yeah. um, because ultimately if, if okay. you're going to use that to lead your, your DB to DC transfer, the responsibility is on the advisor. Okay, okay, that's fair enough. I mean, one thing, I, okay, so the point I was going to make was that when this model is being used by product providers and asset managers, certainly on the, the distribution side of their businesses, to either provide financial planning tools or advice tools or to design new products, generally speaking, almost without exception that I can recall, those product providers and asset managers will actually have used our own standard capital market assumptions when the, 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 the model is being used in that, in that context. Oftentimes, if they're using the model in a risk management um, capital, so you so you're saying so you're saying that if big companies, big providers are using it, it must be robust. That's what you're saying. Take it out. Clearly, clearly, value. clearly, they have subjected that model to a lot of <coughs> due diligence. So, so there are a few things. I'm not saying it's sorry. Yeah. I'm not saying it's, it's right. You've got to subject it to due diligence. I, it was a point I was making that these guys are not mucking around with the the, the standard assumptions. They might have. They might absolutely have uh, assumptions that they would question, and there'll be a process of discussing what those assumptions are, rationalising them with their own quads, their own asset managers understanding. Maybe, 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 maybe fit the inputs to sort of make the sort of no, outcome no, on the product. That's, that that's, I think that, that's the cynical ones. That, well, that's the point I'm trying to make. Ignore it. That's the point I'm trying to make. Well, that's one of the two points I'm trying to make. They're, the, to, to avoid any notion that that's happening, they will leave our assumptions there. Yeah. Yeah. So. I, a few things that strike me, I mean, some, some parallels to the uh, U.S. space and some not. So, as I said earlier, like, I, due diligence is difficult for any of these platforms. We, we see a lot of these same, like, due diligence challenges uh, in, in the U.S. as well. And, you know, we found that ultimately it's, it, you know, where the due diligence really seems to draw from comes from a few places. One is, um, sort of, as, as Phil has highlighted, so the kind of, the implicit third-party vetting of other large firms have vetted this, so I'm going to be comfortable with it as well. As well as, frankly, just at some point, you either you know you either trust the brand and the name of the company, or or, or you don't. Um, the second is actually that a lot of platforms uh, end up effectively vetting these tools. So for some of our more captive and restricted platforms, in particular, uh, uh, like literally, the advisors are only allowed to use a particular Monte Carlo or financial planning software that's been approved by the platform, and you're not allowed to use anything off-platform because they haven't vetted the off-platform ones. They've vetted that one, and they're confident that you can use that one with your clients. Um, you know, in terms of things like the ability to change and model the assumptions, so, you know, as I said earlier, like in our great American spirit, you know, I can change the stuff even if I screw myself with it, uh, you know, we all desperately love to be able to change our assumptions as well. Uh, that being said... Uh, I cannot think of anything that takes on more liability than taking their 133-page document and saying, I know better than them because I saw on TV that market returns are going to be low. Uh, you know, when you go through, you know, when a regulator comes in because something bad happened for a client and says, so explain to me the methodology that you use to change Moody's assumptions to the ones that you know. <laughs> right, yeah, so you blame me. Uh, uh, like, you know, what, 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 what did you use to substantiate changing the default assumptions in this software? I'm going to venture to say that anybody in this room is going to have a process that was less robust than what they probably did. So... You know, it's one thing to go through a process of vetting it in the first place, and you know, I'm all for the ability to change assumptions because it's like hardwired into us as Americans. Uh, but uh, like, frankly, you know, if your greatest concern is around the liability risk, that is the last possible thing I would touch if you're concerned about regulatory and liability risk. Is mucking around with those assumptions, especially because some of these models are so complex, you will not even realize the things that you might have screwed up in that model <laughs> when you started changing some assumptions and not others and didn't realize the interplay uh, between them. So I would be really, really careful there. Um, that being said, like the one other thing I have to admit that comes to mind to me, just, just hearing this whole discussion, so you know, for anyone wants like the, the free entrepreneurial business opportunity, um, frankly, what I hear is an opportunity for a third-party platform to emerge that reviews and vets software and writes their own third-party reviews of it. You know, there's no reason you can't have the equivalent of like the consumer reports of 
financial planning and Monte Carlo software uh, where someone comes forth and actually says, look, you know, we vetted through them. Here are the good ones, here are the bad ones, here are the ones that have some wonky assumptions you should be aware of and, and do independent write-ups of it. So you can have some means to get due diligence aside from liking to spend your Friday nights reading 133-page documents the way that, that Abraham does. Um, so you get some midpoint between reading that 133-page document and needing, to, and needing to take it on faith while they say their other clients like their assumptions, so I'm going to buy their software too. Uh, yeah, this is maybe going slightly off topic, but we're all assuming here that all financial advisors are great financial planners and a great, finan great financial planner. And as we know that they're not, you know, talking about this Monte Carlo. People not in the room. People not in the room. Yeah, this is the top slice in the room. And if we're struggling with this, then oh my god. So if you're a bad financial planner and you've got a great Monte Carlo t tool, it's still very destructive to the end client. Um, so most advisors in the UK are struggling to become good at financial planning. You know, learning the Monte Carlo side to it is is the cherry on the top almost. So bad financial planners using good Monte Carlo tools is probably very very destructive. Although bad financial planners changing their assumptions in their Monte Carlo. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Uh, I'll bring you. Oh, there's one there. Right. Uh, uh, I'm just wondering what what input the regulator has uh, on the assumptions and correlations that go into the model. Good, good question. Um, they try and have as little as possible, really. Um, yes. What they try and do is put some very, very broad guardrails around it. Um, I guess the FCA in the UK have moved to, and I would say this is a positive thing, they've moved to more of a principles-based approach to regulating some of this stuff. Um, up until a few years ago, they had some quite uh, prescriptive rules. And for example, I can't remember exactly, exactly what rule was, but what they've done is they've taken the deterministic projection rules and they tried to sort of almost make them stochastic. So they'd said something like, and I can't remember exactly what the COBS rule was, but it was something like, don't project the median return on a 70-30 equity bond fund above the median, or above the intermediate deterministic illustration rate. Now, once you start writing rules like that, it just creates an absolute morass of mess. Because of, of course these models are all economically coherent. All, you know, your projection of an equity asset and interest rates are all joined up. It starts to undermine the, 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 eff effectively the quality of the whole, the whole model. So for one reason or another, the FCA actually removed most of those prescriptive rules. And I've just left in basic guardrails to try and ensure that Providers of stochastic modeling, Monte Carlo simulation are, you know, if you like, robust, are doing the right things. For example, things like don't run a Monte Carlo simulation with less than a certain number of simulations, and they provide some guidance around that. Um, you know, there's, there's some guidance about how you might use a stochastic model or a stochastic projection alongside other financial planning tools, but they've backed away from some of the more prescriptive assumptions about actual growth rates and things like that. Yeah, and it's, it's the same, I know really fast, it, it's basically the same in the U.S. So like a, if, you're, if your underlying baseline assumptions around what the median returns are that you're modeling around in the first place are wonky, you, know, you, you do Monte Carlo projections assuming equities have a, you know, a, a return of 13% in the standard deviation of 8, uh, someone's going to come in and ask you some questions about it, but short of just return assumptions, underlying return assumptions that are completely wonky, um, regulators are basically hands off to it in the US as well. I, before I give this back to the, to the audience, I wanted to ask um, Tim, so, so we're talking about this from, from a financial planning point of view. How should illustration, product illustration, be changing? Because essentially what, what you have currently is largely deterministic or, or be within a certain range. Yeah, okay, I, mean, I think it goes back to what people take in. So if you gave uh, um, illustrations with a whole variety of uh, different outcomes, you can, you can confuse people. So I think the model we've got, um, where on a first level you are indicating that there is not one certain outcome, that's mm -hmm. the first point, that, that people then understand that there are, there are a, number of, a number of different possible outcomes. So if you've got some sort of high, medium, low, um, set to a reasonable... Uh, level based on what we perceive the econ economy and the outlook to be. Um, that's about as complex as you probably need to get, and as about, about as complex as is useful for, for most customers. Yeah, I think that works <coughs> fine for accumulation, probably. I think there is a problem with decumulation using fixed rate 
projections within state, within annual statements. I think I think it does give um, policyholders probably a, a overconfidence in retirement outcomes. And I do I, I do I do think I, I, without significantly changing the format of the of the of the annual statement, I think you could improve the information and make it more valuable. I don't think you'd need to start talking about stochastic modelling or, 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 or presenting horrible fan charts or anything like that. I, I think you probably still continue to present a, a similar amount of information. I just think you could make it more more valuable to the customer in terms of managing their retirement plan if you maybe calculated the numbers in a slightly different way or, or maybe presented a slightly different set of information. But I think the, I think the overall layout would probably be very similar to what it is at the moment. Thank you. Um, does anyone in the audience have a question? Yeah. Um, it's a question to everybody. Um, the internet's here, um, and since you know, a thousand years of only two percent annuitisation, we haven't had the internet that long. But really, for the Brits first, how do you see online advice going? Because it scares the life out when I look at illustrations these days and the rubbish you know the the, the clients believe. Um, but how do you see that going, and then sort of what's happening in the US? Yeah. Yeah. So? Yeah. I think we first of all need to establish what is advice and what is managing money in the slickest way possible. So at the moment, there isn't really any online advice room, really, unless you're an advisor that's heavily regulated that just happens to do client meetings online. Um, so yeah, in America, we've got Wealth Fund, Betterman, and various other uh, firms that manage money. That's in very... not entirely true, but well, what's not entirely true? Um, there are on the the reads. Okay, at least one okay, we've, we've, we've got that Meg, which is calling themselves no, the first. No, not Meg. <coughs> money on toast. Money on toast is one, and and well, well, Horizon is the new one. Well, Horizon is regulated anyway, uh, as we know as well. So um, again, it's DIY uh, platforms. Personally, I'm not scared of robo advisors because uh, robo advisors are, uh, are not advisors at the moment. Basically, yeah. <coughs> the stuff that we deal with with our, with our clients can't be replicated. I believe there's always a face to face to face advice. I believe there's a massive gap in the accumulation phase of clients not getting any advice, um, so they need to accumulate their money in a certain way before they then need advice. Again, I don't know exactly what age that point is, but people in their twenties and thirties are probably in, in, in that gap space at the moment. Um, I, I, I'm excited that saving money online becomes a lot more slippery and easier for people to do, hence for people like Nutmeg. Uh, pure robo-advisors though, I've not really seen any impact against proper client-facing financial advisors as of yet. Um, but there's not many of us as we know, we can't even agree on that, I think it's 21,000 of us. Um, and again, there's half a million people getting to 65 every year, so there's more than enough business for still face-to-face -face advice. But it's an interesting space and I'm excited to see how it pans out. We'll, we'll come back to you, Michael. We need to hear the UK view. I mean, I just read really fast some numbers because uh, that, that strikes me. Uh, 21,000 21, client facing financial advisors in the UK at the moment. And what's your population? 64 million. 70 million. Okay. All right, go ahead. I'm doing some math. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can become a financial advisor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we'd accept that. I think um, for me, I think what you might see is product providers extending their administration platforms to try and support incrementally um, better administration of, of, <coughs> of, of savings policies and of investment policies. So, you know, taking some of the stuff I talked about earlier, putting that on, an, on a product administration platform to automatically either send out letters to clients to possibly cover a slightly more um, I guess uh, useful annual statement, possibly even to trigger adjustments in withdrawal rates, for example, that you could take it to assume, or even to, to trigger adjustments in asset allocation. All that, in theory, could be done, could be done today, automatically. One, we've, we, you know, as an example, we've got a couple of clients who batch process all of their all of their policyholders through that calculation on a, I think it's on a monthly basis. And a letter goes out to the, the, those, 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 either those individuals or their, their advisors to say, you know, you've fallen below the income comfort zone, you should do something about this, go and do something. Right? So that, that's happening at that, at that level. That's, that's, that, those, those two clients actually, neither of them are in the UK at the moment. 
uh, they're both in Ireland, both, 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 both DC pension administration platforms doing, doing that. So that's, 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 that's the product providers almost encroaching back and incrementally into that sort of, I guess, ongoing review space. And that's clearly the big opportunity, I think, for advisors is to do that face-to-face -face on a scalable basis using technology, using online advice, or building a, a kind of D to C proposition themselves to allow them to service that review demand on a much more scalable basis. So, so I think I think product providers are going to start to do this, and I would imagine that will start to motivate the advisory side of the the, the market to, 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 to do to do the same and to scale that capability up. So. Yeah. So. Breaking down different types of advice, what we're finding with recent financial guidance from the FCA is just trying to do anything helpful uh, can be deemed regulated advice. <laughs> um, so uh, I think you will find a lot more providers finding themselves doing that. Um, and uh, you know, simple tools, uh, information that they're providing is actually taking into that sort of space. Moving on to personal recommendations, um, I think that's very difficult online. Um, how can a computer ask all the right questions in all the right orders um, and understand looking in the whites of the eyes of a human being whether they really understood that? I think that's difficult. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, all right. So, so, uh, so a few things. First, uh, you know the the robo advisor trend has got a huge, huge amount of press in the uh, in the U.S. and certainly has kind of expired globally as well. Um, but I think it's important to put them in context for where they are even in the U.S. market space. So if I take what I'll call like the true robo-advisor platforms in the U.S., which is basically Wealthfront, Betterment, and Future Advisor, um, and I put together all the assets that they have cumulatively raised in the roughly five years that they've been around, they have raised uh, a little bit over $3 billion of uh, funds under management. Now, that's certainly not a trivial number, but relative to the U.S. space, that is a completely trivial number. Uh, our market size uh, for uh, uh, investable assets is $30 trillion. So the cumulative market <coughs> impact of five years of all the buzz and the hubbub around robo-advisors, they have 0.01% market share, which is just irrelevantly small. If you narrow it down to the subset of assets that are managed assets in the U.S., about 60% of U.S. investable assets are managed assets, uh, $17 trillion or so, uh, they've got maybe 0.015% market share. So, I mean, they, they've had no material penetration or market adoption whatsoever relative to the size of our space. Um, the second note, uh, kind of getting back to the, the comments here, is... is they are not, not with saying the robo-advisor label, which I'll take responsibility for because I wrote the first article that called them robo-advisors uh, back in 2012. Um, they don't, they're not really advisors because they're not actually delivering any kind of personal financial advice whatsoever. Uh, they are basically automated asset allocation programs that take a relatively straightforward 10 to 12 question intake questionnaire about time horizon and risk tolerance and give you an asset allocation that then is managed. It's, it's roughly the equivalent of a managed mutual, balanced mutual fund. They just disaggregate it out so you can see all the individual parts and put a, a robo platform asset allocation fee around it instead of having a mutual fund asset allocation yes. fee around it or ETF. So that, that's, that's really all that they're doing and again is why they're not really material asset size and not having any material adoption in the U.S. Um, there certainly are some platforms that are looking to the next stage of this, which is actually giving more substantive advice, like true advice. Um, the problem there, you know, there are one or two that have kind of started experimenting with this already. The problem that they're quickly finding out is like real world human situations are really, really close. Um, frankly, I think just given where computer programming is going, in five or ten years, I think they will be able to build sufficiently large sort of algorithmic decision trees that they can get through much of the kinds of guided questions to answer at least relatively straightforward uh, personal finance questions for consumers. The caveat is I'm still not particularly convinced it's going to have all that much effect on the size of the market, uh, particularly relative to uh, advisors. They may grab some people who are going to be self-directed no matter what and would rather have a website tell them what to do than search on a bunch of websites to get their own information. But I'm not convinced that all that replaces advisors. And a lot of it just comes down to, as, as I think Phil said, just the, the human behavior issues, right? Like, 
if it was so easy to solve all of our problems to, to um, just make websites to tell you what to do, like I could solve the US's obesity problem. I'll just make a website that says you should eat less and exercise more, and we could solve the whole thing. Right? Like, but it's not a problem of information. I mean, if you don't know you need to eat less and exercise more, you're probably not going to magically lose weight. But the information alone is not going to change your behavior. And if you're trying to do this and your website keeps nagging you and it's not working, what does everybody normal person do? You break it. You just stop, yeah, you stop going to the website and then you don't feel bad anymore. <laughs> right? Like, they're, they're, uh, technology can facilitate some self-directed people to get a little further down the road than they would have. It doesn't take a person who needs help and suddenly help them when they can't necessarily do it on their own, right? And like, if I'm in denial about my financial problems, I'm not going to answer the questionnaire in a manner that's going to give it useful, give me useful financial advice because I'm in denial about my own problems. So I'm not going to input the right information. It's not going to give me the right recommendation. So I'm, I'm not particularly convinced those platforms are going to gain much momentum in the future either. Now, depending on how you want to view it, either opportunity or challenge in your marketplace in particular. So like, these numbers fascinate me. Uh, so you're at about 21,000 advisors for call it like 65 to 70 million population. So to put it in context, the U.S. marketplace is about five times the size. We're a little over three. We're 300, 350 million people. We have 300,000 client-facing financial advisors. So our population is five times the size, and our advisor population is 15 times the size. So we literally have three times the advisor per capita that you do here. On top of that, we have 700,000 people who are purely registered as insurance sales agents. They're not full financial advisors, but realistically they give some portion of advice and because we don't regulate the term advisor in the US, they all call themselves advisors even though they're not. So when you put it into that context, there's basically a million client-facing people who talk some kind of financial advice with consumers in the US. So our, you know, our ratio, we're, we're five times the size in terms of the public and 50 times the size in terms of the competitive landscape. So 10 times the advisor per household. So on the one hand, you can certainly see why it's challenging for robo-advisors to get any penetration in our space, because like, you know, 17 humans to serve you are stones to throw away. Uh, some are much better than others, or actually some are much worse than others. Uh, but you know, the, the, the advice market is so saturated with advisors already, consumers are just overwhelmed trying to figure out who's a good one and who's a bad one. Uh, you know, I suppose that means from the from the space here, I, you know, frankly, maybe there's a little bit more of a market gap for robo advisors to come in here simply because you have a much smaller advisor population to serve your country's population. But still, that probably only means that they're going to be capturing market share that you're not serving, not that they're taking clients away from you. And, and certainly, that's what we see in the U.S. space. Uh, they are not taking any clients away from advisors. They're getting a small subset of people, and it's small, because we 0.01% market share. But they're taking a small subset of people who were not serving advisors anyways, and the robo-advisors in the U.S. are now realizing that advisors are actually so effective and that they're, at the end of the day, just a technology tool. They're a nice technology tool, but they're just a technology tool, that they're all pivoting to advisors. And so about three-quarters of the major robo-advisor players in the U.S. have now built advisor platforms, so advisors can use their technology to help their clients. Uh, because A, they're not raising it with consumers directly, and B, <coughs> as advisors, we want good technology to help our clients too, right? Like it's not yeah. unique. Great stuff. Thank you. I'm going to try and wrap this up. So, um, you, you've got a question? Yeah. Uh, uh, you is it that we try to model something that we cannot model, which is duplicated dials which are random and just random? and nothing more than random. And we spoke volatility a lot, and we did not spoke about the fall risk. One day, one day, I don't know which day, it would be great to know, one big country will default. And uh, that is probably zero in your models. But if that happens, I'm sure that my retirees or your retirees will be a lot worse. So volatility, yes, it's nice. Portfolio will go up to when, when default happens, when the portfolio is impaired, that the real the reality comes home. And it's not better to use some humility when we advise people and say, look, we actually don't know what will happen. We have tried to do something here, kind of model it, and, but it may work out totally, totally different. We don't know where the future is coming. Thank you. Are we trying to model the impossible? That's uh, the question. Uh, I'm sure it's not impossible. Uh, <laughs> no, it's, just, it's just a model, isn't it? It's just a model. It's just a framework for comparing some different investment strategies or different products or different withdrawal plans. And you just have to be absolutely open about limitations. And this comes back to this point about due diligence. You know, 
I do think in the UK retail market, and again, I'm sure the US is the same, you know, there's just this, there's almost this assumption the model is correct, and, it, and it's the same, it's the same reason as, as the due, for the same reason as that the due diligence has been very poor. You know, it's just someone else has checked this. We're not, we're not going to look at the, at the detail. We're not going to read the 133-page document, and therefore we are unable to explain the limitations in this model to our client or to the next person down the, down the chain. Uh, and, I, and I think, yeah, being able, so one of the short documents that should exist, not the 133-page, <coughs> is the list of limitations um, of the model and, and the modeling approach. And yeah, the fact that you maybe aren't capturing the risk of the US uh, government defaulting, which is pretty low, but you know, at various points in the last two or three years, you know, someone might have said it's number zero. Um, As Winston Churchill once said, <laughs> <laughs> the Americans will eventually do the right thing after we've resolved all other possibilities. Oh. <laughs> so, so, so you're right, the model, the model may assign a very low probability to that, uh, and you wouldn't ever show it on a, on a retail financial planning tool, um, because it, it would probably lead to particularly odd behavior of, of retail investors and um, you have to you should be able to explain that limitation within your within your within the statement you're making to the person using the model so so, so humility is probably the word yeah I to me to me the issue is that frankly we I think as humans we don't actually process probabilities and probabilistic outcomes very well we just we our, our brains are not really hardwired to it so you know, if, if the weather forecast is a 10% chance of rain. So, you know, odds are on that it's clear. And then I go out tomorrow and it rains. Was my forecast wrong? And the answer is really no, or at least no, not necessarily. If you really want to know if my forecast was wrong, let's see how I do over the next 10 or 100 predictions of 10% rain. And if ultimately I average out to 10%, then the answer is I'm completely right and a highly effective forecaster. But it still remains true that when I predict a 10% probability of rain, it will either rain or it will not rain. So we have no we have no capacity after the fact to judge, particularly in a single instance, whether my probability projection was right or not. That being said, does that mean therefore it's useless to ever do any kind of weather forecast? Because even if I'm even if I'm perfectly right about the percentages, it always either does rain or doesn't rain. Therefore, I should not have done uh, any forecasting. No, not at all. I mean, the forecasting is still incredibly valuable. It's still very relevant. It lets us make far better educated decisions than having no forecast. But we need to acknowledge that any time there's a probability on either end, we should ultimately have a plan for, for both outcomes. We can weigh how much time we can <coughs> plan based on how likely it is and so forth. But you know, the fact that I probabilistically project something to occur and then either it does or does not, does not mean I'm wrong in either instance, but it meant, it's meant to be a guidepost about where to spend your time, where to spend your effort, the kinds of decisions and trade-offs that you're going to weigh and formulating a plan about what to do with them. Now, as I said earlier, I think one of the challenges around how we use Monte Carlo right now is we tend to obsess so much about that single one number, which clients in their head either equate to it's going to happen or it's not going to happen. They make it an absolute zero or a, or a hundred because we don't really know how to process probabilities well. And we don't really, I think, do a great job at showing people here are the decisions you might make in either of the scenarios. So that's uh, it's a weakness in our software. It's a weakness around the globe. And I, I think that's where we go next. But, yeah, I mean, there's a piece of it that's ultimately going to be uh, unknowable, because if I knew 100% which one was going to occur, my probabilities would be 0 or 100, not 10. But the fact that we're dealing with something that is inherently uncertain, I don't think it all makes you know, forecasting invalid. Uh, I think it makes it uh, as valid or more valid, because we now really have to consider lots of different possible outcomes. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask this from a practicing advisor point of view. Uh, and I've only been in the business six years. There's obviously people in the room that have been in there for, I've been in the business for a lot longer. And my guess, so I've been using comprehensive planning software for coming up to my sixth year review now with most of my original clients. And my original guess six years ago, without having done my tweaks every year, have been scarily quite accurate. Um, without having to do my tweaks every year after, uh, every year since, since I've been a client. Um, so from a practical point of view, I'm, I'm happy with my guesses, which ultimately what they are. I mean, we, I need to get a bit more comprehensive in terms of some of the Monte Carlo tools uh, and get a bit better around that. But from a practical point of view, I'm seeing it directly working with my clients. Michael, have you seen that with your clients again, using your software from your guesses many years ago to where you are now? Or, or yeah, I mean, I, I think... 
So, I mean, it depends a little bit how far we go back. I started in the business in, uh, in 2000, like right at the peak of our tech boom. So the past week has been interesting for me because literally uh, the NASDAQ market in the U.S. just got back to where it was when I started 15 years ago. <laughs> we just got made whole. Uh, the S&P only got back to where it was when I started about two years ago. Uh, so I, you know, like 13 years into my career, and I still hadn't actually seen the market get higher than it was when I started, um, which certainly shapes your worldview in a lot of ways. Um, so I, you know, when I when I go all the way back, I mean, are, 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 you know, if I pulled out projections from clients back in like the really early 2000s, yeah, we were probably a little overly optimistic. Um, I can't think of a single one that's massively derailed. I think there are a couple that at least have probably tightened their belts a little bit along the way. Because, hey, they went 13 years without making a dime. So at some point, you're like, geez, i gotta, I got to tighten up a little bit. Uh, but, I, you know, frankly, for a diversified portfolio, they still held up okay in part because uh, our, our, our sovereign, our government bonds have actually still had a heck of a run since, uh, since then. You know, interest rates went from 65 to 2. It uh, gives you a heck of a lift on your bonds, even though your equities haven't been <coughs> You know, for the clients that are, you know, in the past six or seven years, yeah, they're 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 doing fine. They're doing fine. I mean, you know, the 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 kind of bear market that we had in two thousand eight, two thousand nine, like yes, it was scary in real time, but like, you know, it veed back really quickly. Frankly, just relative to like generic Monte Carlo projections on a year over year basis, it was barely a two standard deviation event. It was not a black swan, it was not a fat tail, all that stuff. Daily volatility were, was like massive fat tails, but that's part of what happens. You know, we have a fat tail down, we have a fat tail up, and then two days later you're right back where you were when you started and nothing happened. Uh, and, and so I don't even find our Monte Carlo projections having been inaccurate going through the financial crisis. If we did daily modeling, they would have been accurate. If I had 100 to 1 leverage like a hedge fund, I would have imploded, as many of ours did. Uh, but you know, as a financial advisor with clients who are not leveraged, who take out only a couple percent a year, every, everybody's fine. They're 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 doing fine. They're certainly not going to you know die with a gajillion dollars left over. We're not getting one of the good ones. We got kind of one of the mediocre ones. But you know, they're 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 doing fine. And and the fact that the Monte Carlo projections even in two thousand eight told them there was some risk you'll have to make adjustments, and that's part of what manifested. And and they've been living that reality. Yeah. And, and, and just to build, I think that, that positioning is really important. Um, models, whether they predict particular countries defaulting, they generally say that from time to time bad stuff happens. Um, <laughs> um, really occasionally, really, really bad stuff happens. Um, and the models themselves will, will update and learn from experience. Um, and as long as people um, and advisors, from my point of view, you know, review with their clients on an ongoing basis, whether the plan is working and re responding to circumstances, that's the most important thing. Well. Yeah. So, so what, one other note I just add to this in, in thinking about um, ways to handle uncertainty and, and, and talking clients through it. So, you know, the, the whole idea of like, uh, pick your quote black swan fat tail event. So, you know, the U.S. or some other country defaults, or uh, hey, our models are just using normal distributions and that's wrong. So, like, I think about this in practical terms of clients. So, I, you know, I do a I do extensive Monte Carlo analysis with my clients. I've determined they have a ninety four percent probability of success. We make our various decisions about what their retirement plan is going to be. Then I come to the next day and I say, you know, what? I, we just got this amazing new Monte Carlo software. It is so much better at modeling these black swan fat tail events. You know, it thought that there was no chance of of uh, extreme market events. Events, but it correctly recognizes they're 100 times more likely, which means there's like a 2% chance instead of a 0.002% chance. But hey, we've got it in there now. Now, of course, some of those events will happen later in your retirement. It won't matter anyways because you'll get the good sequence, but it could happen <coughs> bad early on. So, you know, we've, we've really, we've done the new numbers in your retirement plan, and we have determined that a much more accurate model is that your prob plan actually has a 92.1% probability of success, not 94. Now, what are you going to do differently with your client? Yeah. And, 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 like, and, the answer's, and, and like the answer is basically nothing, right? Like you're not going to change what you do because your better black, tail, uh, uh, black swan fat tail based model shows 92 instead of 94. You're going to do the same thing at 94.